morning uh, and welcome to the seventh meeting of 2014 of the Public Audit Committee. Uh, can I ask uh, members and uh, witnesses and indeed the public to make sure that electronic devices are switched to flight mode so that they don't interfere with uh, the, re the recording equipment? Um, item one, can we agree to take uh, item four in private? Thank you. Item two, we have the section 23 report, shaping care for older people. Um, this morning we have a, a panel of, of witnesses and I'd like to uh, welcome to the committee uh, Annie Gunnar Logan, who's the director of the Coalition of Care Providers Scotland. Um, we will be joined shortly by Ranald Mayer, who's the chief exec of uh, Scottish Care. I believe that he has a meeting with the, the Scottish Government at the moment. Um, David Williams, um, Executive Director of Social Work in Glasgow City Council. Uh, Katrina Renfrew, Director of Corporate Planning and Policy, NHS Glasgow and Clyde. Uh, John Walker, Executive Director uh, of Housing and Community Care, Perth and Kinross. And Bill Nicholl, General Manager, Perth and Kinross, CHP of NHS uh, Tayside. So welcome uh, to the committee. Um, I believe that um, Bill Nicholl and, and, and John Walker, you would like to make a, a joint opening statement um, and then David Williams uh, and I think Ranul Merifair Ives would also like to make a statement separately. So if I could invite, uh, first of all, Bill Nicholl and, and, and John Walker. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, uh, thank you for uh, providing the opportunity for us to address the committee this morning. Um, Certainly, on behalf of uh, my colleague and I, uh, we do welcome the opportunity to provide oral evidence to the committee in support of its inquiry into the Scottish Government's reshaping care of older people's programme and associated change fund ar arrangements. Since the inception of the programme in 2011, NHS Tayside has been building on the strong, existing strong partnership arrangements with Angus, City of Dundee and Perth and Kinross Councils together with the third sector organisations and Scottish care representatives in each area. Um, we do understand that within the report, Perth and Kinross has been cited positively for its leadership and outcomes for older people in both the reshaping care of older people's report that you have in front of you and the pilot joint inspection report for older people's services uh, uh, conducted recently for Perth and Kinross. Um, we would like to uh, say that in particular the strengths that are making a difference to older people and their carers in our area is a growing focus in achieving positive individual outcomes for older people, a high motivation and strong commitment of our staff to improving the lives of older people in Perth and Kinross, the development of a strategic approach to community involvement and community capacity building and a clear and shared vision and positive leadership from our managers at every level. The Change Fund initiatives themselves have made a clear impact in a number of areas. Um, the development of a rapid response service linked to an immediate discharge service to improve discharge pathways and the uh, avoidance of uh, um, unscheduled admissions where appropriate. Our uh, dementia work has been strengthened by the Strathmore Dementia Project, which has instituted a range of community-based supports to people with dementia and their carers. An investment and closer working relationships with Perth and Kinross Voluntary Action Service to develop engagement capacity and link volunteering capacity to those supported by local services on discharge from hospital. And I'll hand over to my colleague John Walker from this point. And thank you, Bill. Thanks, Chair, for the opportunity to speak. There have been challenges in managing this process. Um, we have been rigorous in taking a business case approach to targeting our investments and evaluating these investments. And although these commitments have been made by our partnership for as long as possible, the nature of the change fund is that we have fixed term contracts for staff and that has resulted in a need to accommodate staff turnover. In addition to the change fund resources, uh, both uh, the local authority and NHS Tayside have been innovated, innovative in use of its own resources um, to augment the change fund and funding support for local unscheduled care action plans. And we have a particularly interesting test of change within our Angus and Dundee um, geographical areas that we'd wish to pursue um, within Perth and Kinross, um, which is about um, preventing unplanned admissions and getting preventative care to older people as quickly as possible. 
All these developments are individually and collectively beginning to show a real impact in improving outcomes against a rising demand through our demographics. But the big challenge is one of taking improvement forward to a level of transformation, of scaling these developments and moving to sustainable delivery that is embedded in a way that support is provided alongside the individual and community capacity is built and resilience built within the communities. And that is the key challenge for us is to move the resources around the system. We have access to a rich source of data through the integrated <coughs> resource framework, which provides the knowledge of resource consumption across health and social care. And it's through the use of that data and visiting GP practices and building locality teams around GPs that we will manage, I think, to get some traction in relation to understanding the impact of GP decisions and at the moment, we're using it to identify GP practices with hospital admission rates in order to promote integrated team working and the use of alternative services to hospital. The analysis of that variation in resource consumption and health outcomes between the GP together with the development of a multi-disciplinary uh, multi, um, locality team and a, an engagement process with the local people, which provides confidence in the way that we do change services, all of which will, I think will provide the conditions for planning for the sustainable commissioning of services into the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Williams. Uh, <coughs> convener, thank you for extending an invitation to the Chief Executive of Glasgow City Council to uh, present to the Audit Committee, and I'm happy to speak on his behalf here today. Uh, reshaping care for older people is a necessary and difficult social policy to implement. Uh, necessary for all the reasons outlined elsewhere, primarily demographics uh, and the level of public funds in the years to come. Uh, we simply cannot continue to do what we have done for years into the future. It is also the right thing to do. Most people tell us that they want to remain in their own homes. It is difficult uh, because it is a change that is set within a context of uh, incredibly complex interrelationships, uh, dependencies and cultures between and across four completely different sectors uh, established over countless years. And intermingled, intermingled through all of that uh, is the level of expectation of what the state uh, will provide when one reaches a certain age uh, and level of functioning. Ordinarily, it will take time and patience to deliver the change uh, because of the profound depth of the difficulties I've touched upon. Uh, we should perhaps, therefore, uh, not be at all surprised by the conclusion that Audit Scotland uh, reached recently. Uh, it will take a lot more resource, in my view, than 1.5% of total spend over a time-limited <coughs> period uh, in order to create the environment for change in a safe way. At the very least, that should be seen uh, as an ask that the ch change fund is not removed uh, at the end of this financial year. It will take a step change from here on uh, in terms of activity and pace in order to meet what is becoming uh, an increasingly stretched environment. There is no slack whatsoever in the system. Uh, so, for instance, uh, when two hospital social workers go off on long-term sick uh, at the end of November and the delayed discharges in the south, go, uh, of, south of Glasgow go through the roof uh, two months later as a consequence. It is obviously considerably more complicated than just having two social workers go off on sick leave, uh, but such an incident is a trigger uh, when there is no capacity in the system. This need for pace will cause tension if we operate on the basis that we need consensus from all stakeholders before we do anything, as we have done to date, uh, albeit the commitment to partnership working is absolute. It will take brave decisions at a local and national level to move towards a culture of early intervention and prevention being the norm uh, rather than it being seen as a project. The shift in the balance of care necessarily involves a shift in the nature of the relationship between the state and the individual an emphasis on an acceptance of risk and effective management of risk rather than risk aversion, an acceptance of the need for pragmatism at times rather than an idealistic and unsustainable position. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr Mayor, I believe you would like to make a statement. Yes, thank you. Uh, sorry, apologies for my uh, late arrival. Uh, Scottish Care welcomed the report uh, from, the, from Audit Scotland on reshaping care. We had been part of the advisory group to the report. Uh, and Scottish Care has taken on a role of representing the independent sector at both a national and local level in the various uh, reshaping care and change fund partnerships. Uh, 
And I think, importantly, in terms of the, the report itself, I was, its first paragraph says the public sector in Scotland faces significant challenges in reshaping care for older people. This is on page five. I, I thought it was unfortunate that the words the public sector in were there at the beginning. Scotland faces significant challenges and it is not just a public sector agenda, it's an agenda which the third and independent sectors share and indeed the people of Scotland share. So I, I just think this should not be a narrow focus on the agendas within the public sector but actually on the, the wider challenge facing us. Uh, more than half the social care provision in Scotland is delivered by the third and independent sectors. More than half the social services workforce is employed in the third and independent sectors. So, importantly, from the outset, we feel we have to be seen as full partners to this process. And I've wanted to be, to be able to come, step up to the plate on assisting the reshaping of care and the shift in the balance of care. Uh, uh, reshaping care of older people is a complex uh, change programme uh, and uh, the, you know, we've been pleased in some of it. We, we, we've seen it as a very variable experience across the country. There have been parts of the country where we feel the third and independent sectors have been accepted as full partners in the process and it looks as if that will carry forwards into the, uh, the models of he health and social care integration in those areas. But there are other parts where we felt it's been a much, uh, a much more difficult uh, process. But in general, we feel there has been progress, uh, progress made. Uh, the report, just two other, a couple of other points that I want to make by way of introduction. The, the report states there's been a limited shift in resource from institutional care to community services. And just two points to make on that. When we first embarked on discussions with the Scottish Government about reshaping care some six or seven years ago, the goal wasn't that we were going to empty hospitals. It was, it was that we were going to avoid the need to build more of them. That was the goal. It was actually uh, the, 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 the fact that the dem if you simply uh, were led by the demographic, you would need to create more and more uh, acute sector provision simply to cope with demand. So against the demographic, if we've managed to stand still or we've redu reduced slightly, that, in fact, is quite a success. So I think uh, it's, we shouldn't just... I think the danger has been that because there's a perceived need for reshaping care to be self-funding, uh, that there, there has to be a kind of reduction in one area in order to fund development in another. Actually, if we look at the experience in social work and social care uh, in, the, in the 80s when we were developing community care, we were trying to end the reliance on psychiatric hospitals and so on, actually there was significant bridging finance to create new infrastructure whilst you held the existing provision in place and then you were able to close the hospitals. And that programme went on over a period of years. The danger we're in at the moment is that the step change that's needed to invest in community provision uh, needs to have additional funding attached to it. It, it. We're not going to make the progress we need to make if we see it as needing to make a saving in the acute sector in order to fund development elsewhere. That, that frankly, against the demographic, is not going to happen any time soon. Uh, uh, and uh, my, I suppose my last point is just how important this coming year is with the transition to, uh, the, to, to integration and the introduction of shadow boards. The, the change fund has been a, a dress rehearsal. It's been our starter for 10 uh, um, it's, we've got to carry the learning from that forwards uh, into uh, you know, this brave new world of health and social integration and strategic joint commissioning. That's the real test. At that point, we're playing with the whole 4.5 billion and not just 1.5% of it. And what's important, certainly from my perspective, is that the, uh, the, the third and independent sectors have to be accepted as full partners with their uh, with the public sector partners in that process. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much and thank you to all of our contributors. Um, can I 
clarify something, um, Mr Walker and Mr Nicholl. Um, you, you spoke about um, the close working relationships and you know, the integrated uh, services uh, in your area. But what I wasn't clear about is whether it's a close working relationship between um, the CHP, NHS um, and Perth and Kinross Council and then a close working relationship between the CHP and Angus and a close working relationship with Dundee or is it a close working relationship with all of the councils who are working in a more integrated fashion do each of the councils continue to work on their own? Um, yeah, thanks for that question. The, the, I think at Tayside level, uh, certainly NHS Tayside as a, as a body is working very closely with all the partners in each of the three constituent areas of Tayside. When you get down to local level, for example, in Perth and Kinross, then just as Ranulph was saying, it's about all the partners uh, pulling their weight behind what needs to be achieved. So the partnership is very strong in each of the three areas around that part of the health service represented by the CHPs, the local authority, the third sector um, vehicle in, in each area, um, TSIs, and, and the Scottish Care, um, and, and a whole range of other partners, including, as, as John was saying, uh, local community representatives who are really yeah. critical to making But, but, but that's not the question I'm asking. Okay. Um, you know, I understand that you, you say you've got a close working relationship with each of the, the partners. What I'm interested in is whether the partners have a close working relationship with each other or do they still operate on council boundaries and council budgets? The, we work very closely, but we work within our partnership areas because we have different challenges in different areas. So if you take Dundee, for instance, um, it has a, a challenge of um, inequality on a scale that's far different from Perth and Kinross. Um, and although the agenda we're talking about today is about reshaping care for older people, Dundee, will, like all of us, have an eye on, well, what can we do about those people that, as a result of these inequalities, are suffering poor health when they're under the age of 65 and will become dependent on services when they're past 65. So the budgets are not, you know, we're not working across the partnerships around Tayside um, in terms of a relationship across Tayside. We learn <coughs> practice um, and test the change from each other. That's what has worked through the change fund and what's not worked through the change fund. But our, our relationships are very close within our own partnership areas between those partners that Bill described. So, so what, you, what you may find then is, although it's a good working relationship between the NHS and the local authority, um, that in each of the areas, the service delivery uh, and the priorities may actually be different. Absolutely. Um, it's, um, it, it, it depends on the resources that you have available as well. For instance, Dundee doesn't have any community hospitals, yeah. but we all have a share in how Nine Wales operates. But in Perth and Kinross, we have community hospitals. Um, Angus doesn't have any community hospitals. What's really encouraging is if, if we get the confidence of the public, and there was an example recently where Bill attended a, a public forum where there was 200 people involved, uh, members of the public coming along to hear a conversation that we've been building with them over the future of uh, an older people's home and a community hospital, which are in very, community, very close proximity to one another. Um, and these conversations are about, well, what's the model of care that should come out of that hospital and the older people's home jointly in the future? And the public are walking away, not thinking um, they're here to close a hospital, for instance. They're here to listen to a conversation about, well, how can we improve health services locally for that population? And the integrated resource framework, which you mentioned, um, is that an integration between the NHS um, Serve, are the NHS uh, systems and the local authority systems or does it enable you to share information between local authorities as well? The, the, um, <clears throat> the integrated resource framework is something which uh, spans uh, Tayside as one of the, 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 the original demonstrator sites for the, the IRF work. So um, we have those profiles uh, uh, developed within each of the, the three areas within Tayside. So that information is available that allows us, it's at granular level, so it goes down to individual 
client, customer, patient, whatever way you want to describe it. Um, so we can actually aggregate that up across Tayside, uh, look at the whole profile of uh, resource consumption across Tayside, or we can look at it very much within individual locality areas, within a GP practice population, within a, a, a geographic locality within Perth and Kinross, at Perth and Kinross, Angus and, and Dundee. And that gives us huge intelligence because the consumption is all of the health and care consumption. So where you have acute hospitals such as Ninewells, um, you know, all of the activity that goes through any of the services that we have, we can drill that right back down to individual and we can then aggregate it up to get a picture of how different communities, how different areas access and consume health and care resources. And, and that, that, that illustrates the, the variation that there is. And, and, and even after we've adjusted for population factors, we see variation that's accounted for by differential decision making and how much confidence perhaps some GPs might have in, in, in services that are around them that avoid the need for hospitalisation of patients, etc. So it's a very rich vein of information and it can be used right across the area to look at the uh, patterns of consumption regardless of where the individual may in live the in, in, in the Tayside. And, and just to, sorry if I can just add to John's point, um, it's really important that the uh, that this agenda is at a very local level. The, the differences in population and how they're configured. So the challenges in Dundee are quite markedly different from those in, a, in Perth and Kinross and, uh, and in Angus, for example. And it's really important that the future health and care partnerships are at that level and have that focus on their distinct issues within their own community that need to be addressed. And that would be as true of Greater Glasgow and, uh, as anywhere else. OK, Annie. Um, thanks, convener. Just, just as a point of information on that, um, the, the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Bill, uh, for which reshaping care was, was very much a kind of precursor, I guess you could say, um, that requires each partnership area to prepare a strategic plan and set up a strategic planning group. And we're, we're now looking at, um, all of us in various ways, looking at the secondary legislation associated with that. And, and my understanding is that those, the, the joint strategic planning groups will be open to representatives from neighbouring authorities and, and, and indeed neighbouring health boards um, for precisely the reason that I suspect is behind your question. So um, the, you know, it's not just everything happens in the one partnership area. There is there is at least some scope for uh, partnership across authorities as well, just as yeah. a point of information. I mean, we've, I think, got the most partnerships. Um, we're blessed with the most partnerships of any health board in Scotland with six different local authorities. And Anne is right. We certainly intend to, to, to bring the new partnerships together to work with us on the planning of acute services, which clearly don't respect local authority boundaries. And I think one of the really, really important things the new partnerships need to, to do is to focus on the use of acute care by their population because it is unlocking the current models of acute care that is going to be fundamental and notwithstanding the point about it's not just about a shift in resources, I think the reality of the economic climate we're in is we have to make best use of resources. Any given point in time, 10% of our acute hospital beds have got patients in them who are waiting for social care. So just from a simple economic point of view, we have got to get more more rigorously under that problem. The change fund has helped, and I completely agree with David Williams' point that the suggestion that's now being mooted that the change fund will end after this financial year is a really serious concern for, for our board um, because it has supported a, a fairly significant shift for us in delayed discharges. We've reduced by about 30% the number of bed days that are lost uh, to delayed discharges. OK, Bob Doris. Uh, and then on. I appreciate that, that convener. Um, I want to drill down a little bit on on the use of the change fund. A, a brief comment. I don't think the change fund has to achieve everything. Cause the whole one of the things for myself sitting on the health committee is it's about trying new ways of working. And sometimes they'll work, and then you roll out across an area, or they won't work. In which case, you move on to the next thing. So actually, with the change fund, sometimes failure affirms that that's the wrong pathway to go, and you try something different. And I'm content with that. And that's maybe something that an audit wouldn't detect or pick up. However, something that I would like to think that we would pick up would be um, given the fact that this was always about new ways of working and finding ways of mainstreaming that financial commitment around new ways of working. I'd be interested to know from the witnesses uh, an example of something that is working 
something that you've already looked at modelling work about how you mainstream that funding. So not about is there a change fund in 15, 16 or 16, 17, but you're actually looking at your existing core budgets, which I know are under stretch and under strain. I, I appreciate all that. But there was never any doubt that change fund was a temporary lump of cash uh, over a set amount of years for which to try new ways of working and then to model sustainability into the system as you roll it out. So I'd be very keen to know from witnesses an example of something that is starting to work and what steps have been taken to mainstream that, irrespective of whether the change fund is, is extended. And I appreciate the financial strains that, that everyone faces at this time, but that was the task given to you. So I'm keen to know uh, some examples of that. Mr. Yeah. <clears throat> I think one of the areas where we've seen yeah. Most innovation is around intermediate care, sometimes referred to step up, step down care, alternatives to hospital. Most areas actually have developed models. They're not, there isn't a common language framework uh, around this. There's, inter there's some various, but it's a virtual ward model. There are hospital at home models. There are, uh, there's a, so the language of intermediate care is quite varied, and that makes sometimes it more difficult to make comparisons. But I think the use of alternatives to hospital has been one of the areas where there's been significant piloting under the change fund. I think the challenge, and it is again the challenge that comes through from the report, is are they all scalable? And, and, are, and what's the, you, in a sense, the change fund has allowed some quite small scale, sometimes quite high cost <coughs> developments to try out models. I think the, the challenge is then to say which ones of those can we embed and can we embed them at, at a scale which uh, makes an impact. But for instance, some of the dialogue uh, with, uh, with, with Glasgow at the moment is around scaling up intermediate care. The, there has been the testing out of a model. That work isn't quite complete. The Change Fund is continuing to support that, that, that model. But I know that there are similar developments in Edinburgh, in Fife and other parts of the country. So I, I suppose I would flag intermediate care as one area where I think there has been some real progress and where there is at least the potential of that becoming embedded in the, in, uh, in, in the next period of time. I think it's likely that the strategic commissioning plans, as they come through, will all put some em put emphasis on intermediate care uh, uh, for, for the future. Okay. Anyone else? Mr Williams? Uh, thank you, Convener. <coughs> uh, uh, I agree with uh, Mr Mayor in terms of the step, well, we're increasingly calling step down. Uh, provision, uh, and, and that's to facilitate some of the activity that Ms Renfrew uh, referred to around about uh, delayed discharges and uh, uh, assisting uh, the uh, discharge of patients from hospitals to avoid uh, bed lays lost and, and delayed discharges. Uh, we have, uh, within Glasgow, uh, put a, a level of investment <coughs> into developing the model of step down, which is around about uh, supporting uh, patients who are uh, deemed fit for discharge to have an intermediary place of full-time care uh, as they continue their recovery and their recuperation, if you like, uh, 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 and uh, with a, an intention preferably uh, to them returning back to their own homes uh, and their own communities. Um, our, uh, uh, as Mr Mayor has indicated, uh, that's, that's a relatively high cost uh, uh, way of working uh, and we do need to uh, look at how uh, that is scaled up in order to uh, uh, in, in, uh, ensure that we continue to meet the agenda of not having people uh, in hospital a day longer than they actually need, need to be and uh, one of the, uh, the, the important factors that we have to uh, face up to uh, over the course of the next 12 months is not just uh, it seems to me the integration of health and social care, uh, but actually the move uh, from uh, the 1st of April next year to uh, a two-week two uh, delayed discharge uh, target, uh, and how do we actually meaningfully deliver on that in order to ensure that uh, people are coming out of hospital uh, as quickly as they can do. So uh, we are uh, looking uh, at this moment in terms of scaling up significantly uh, the number of uh, and availability of step-down beds uh, from within uh, the private sector within Glasgow. Um, we, uh, within uh, 
uh, social work services have responded to uh, the expected demise of the National Care Homes contract uh, by, uh, uh, by way of uh, looking at a local commissioning uh, model uh, and we are about to move to a uh, framework tender uh, of providers over the course of the next month uh, which will uh, scale up and scale out if you like, the, the level of uh, expected purchasing and provision over the course of the next uh, five uh, years. Uh, and within that, we expect uh, to uh, create the environment uh, which would allow us to uh, fund uh, a significant scaling up of uh, step-down uh, beds um, uh, available to uh, the integrated <coughs> arrangements. Uh, I probably would want to uh, mention as well uh, the uh, success of reablement uh, in, uh, uh, which, is, which was initially funded by the Change Fund in the first two years in relation to uh, the specialist uh, skill base uh, that's required to uh, deliver uh, reablement. That's had some uh, very, very significant levels of success uh, at a scalable model uh, within Glasgow. Uh, I think the challenge is there uh, in terms of how that continues to be funded. Uh, we had funding from the Change Fund for the first couple of years. The local authority has absorbed uh, the funding substantially for the continuation of that provision uh, and the continuing scaling up of it. But we uh, are seeing some significant uh, results in relation to the volumes of older people who are being re-abled, re, uh, regaining the skills and the confidences that, that they had uh, substantially prior to uh, uh, their uh, situation, which led to a hospital admission. Uh, and and that's making an, uh, having an, a significant impact in, th in in throughputting people, if you like, in and out of the system, uh, because that's I think where the money uh, will be substantially released from is about ensuring that people are helped to be independent uh, for longer, uh, and that they are not uh, as dependent on uh, state funding as uh, hitherto. Um, I've got a number of members that, w that want to come in, so I think it's on the same issue. Um, so we'll just let this run for a bit. Bob Doris, Convener. quickly. Yeah, and I think what I was going to say is, if, Scott. Convener, if what we're getting is other examples of, of um, models for scaling up, it'd be quite nice if perhaps you could maybe write to the committee with more information on that. But given, I always get confused when I'm sitting on the health committee or the audit committee, I have to say sometimes, but given we are the audit committee, the numbers around that, so uh, it's the numbers around not just the outcomes for for patients uh, or, or our constituents, but actually in terms of the identification of mainstream cash and where those savings are, be it time release savings or whatever, because I, I get the, the, the pitch, if you like, that you know uh, more change fund would be good, but I think what I would like to see as an audit committee and health committee member is where you're actually identifying core budgets to scale that up to get some of those time, re time release savings out. So I ask that when you're doing that, um, that you identify not just where the change fund has helped you to identify how mainstream budgets could be skewed, but whether in the application of the change fund it helps you to identify gaps in services that actually require additional funding. Okay. T um, well, Katrina Renfrew and then Tavi Scott. Thanks. I think the change fund basically has helped to mitigate a series of other problems and pressures which would probably have overwhelmed the system if the change fund wasn't in place. And I think the audit report highlights some of those. The, the idea that we're releasing money for acute is, is continually undermined by the priority that's still given to acute service targets and acute service developments over everything else in the health service in Scotland. So our financial planning, we're just finishing our financial plan for this year, is entirely driven by waiting time targets, introduction of new drugs, and a whole series of developments that are essentially around increasing spending on the acute sector, not increasing spending in primary care or, or on community services. And what we've used the Change Fund for is to bridge that gap to at least have some investment to make in services to older people. And I think the same applies on primary care, and I think it's really helpful the audit report does pick up the pressures on primary care. Talking to GPs about doing more for older people in the community is not a purposeful discussion when the national contract doesn't actually generate for them any income, any additional resources to do that. And there is no new money for primary care, no new recurring money for primary care that in a visible way in encourages GPs to refocus their practices to deal more with older people. And that's a real problem. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, you invited me as the Director of 
a coalition of caring support providers, but in some ways you've got two for the price of one, um, because I also sit on a body called the... Uh, let me wait while I can get the title of it right. The Health and Social Care Integration Third Sector Advisory Group, and that includes colleagues from a much wider group of third sector organisations. My, my own organisation looks after the ones that, do, that provide commissioned and contracted services, and I have to say they didn't see a lot of the change fund. Um, where the third sector did manage to tap into the change fund was in much more of the kind of community, volunteer-led, um, capacity-building types of support because our concern, I think, was that as well as talking about which, which kind of formalised services we're going to swap from institution to the community, our interest has been in increasing the proportion of older people who don't need services at all um, because we felt that that was, if we, were, if we were going to go anywhere towards reshaping care, we needed to do some of that. Um, and some of the stats right at the beginning of this uh, programme, I think it was, it was something like 90% of people over 65 do not use health or care services. So the, the key to this whole agenda is to make that a bigger number rather than a smaller number. Um, and some of, the, some of the kinds of activities that have been taken forward by the third sector are around things like community connecting, lunch clubs, befriending, you know, pretty, pretty low-level stuff. Um, but, but, but that's where you're going to start increasing the numbers of people who, who are kept out of the system. Um, and, and where the... Ch uh, we reckoned that about... I mean, it, the, there's no national data on this. I mean, I think the Audit Scotland report was, was kind of pretty clear that there's, there's a lot of missing national data. Uh, but one of the missing bits is exactly how much spend went on those kinds of activities. We reckon somewhere between 10 and 20% of the change fund went on that, but that's, that's purely anecdotal, collected from individual organisations who were in receipt of it. Um, and I think one of, one of the issues that we've got, or, or that those projects have got, is the level and the burden of expectation on them now to produce evidence of impact. Um, now, I think Audit Scotland, again, was quite right that we should be using evidence-based practice here. But these kinds of projects are, 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 would have what I, what I would call a soft impact. It's going, to be, it's going to be a very long time before you figure out whether that's going to reduce hospital, ad hospital admissions. And if you don't kind of collect, collect the data around that anyway, you'll never find out. Um, but the connection with the change fund and, and it coming to an end is that a lot of these useful... Uh, projects that are making a strong contribution here, we believe, you know, when the change fund ends, they will end. Um, because the view is that the change fund, and you've heard that already this morning, that the change fund is a non-recurring uh, bit of funding, and the only way that you can achieve sustainability for these projects into the future is then by saving somewhere else. Um, and I think Katrina's already said, you know, some, something about the difficulties of that. So I'll, I'll just read you a quote, if I may. It's a very, very short, convener, from, from one of these organisations. What can I say? Too little of the pot, lots of difficulties with doing good enough evaluation... But at the same time, funders are not telling us what is good enough or even what they want and not really getting what we're trying to do because it's not formal service provision. It feels like huge amounts of money get agreed within the system with hardly any accountability or evaluation, whereas we have to work our socks off and do loads of stuff to justify £20,000. Um, so that's, that's, that's kind of where we're coming from. If, if I can bore you for two more seconds, convener, I, I feel as a matter of protocol... Um, I should say that I do wear another hat in relation to this matter, uh, uh, uh. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I feel obliged to say this because I am actually, since January, a non-executive director of the Scottish Government, and I sit on their Audit and Risk Committee for Health and Wellbeing. Um, I'm not in that capacity today, but I, I have to put that on the record. Okay, thank you. Tavi Scott and then Colin Beatty. Thanks very much, uh, Convener. I just thought Katrina uh, Renfrew's last point about GPs is the one I was really interested in. I thought that very telling. And can I link it to John Walker's remark that I think you made in your opening statement, Mr Walker, about um, the experience that you were obviously having in your area of Scotland. I think you described a multidisciplinary locality team in relation to GPs. Could you just describe what that does and what it means? And more to the point, is it being successful? Is that a model you think is working? We, um, we've taken our staff on a journey of um, working together and learning together so that we understand each other's roles across health and social care. Um, that means that um, the staff that are social workers are understanding the, the issues that are, um, of the, the charge nurse in the hospital and vice versa. 
and we have created these teams to accelerate people out of hospital, reduce average length of delay in hospital, but we are also able to then link with GP practices and use the data that Bill has been talking mm. about through IRF to start a conversation. Sorry, IRF? What sorry, part? sorry, beg your pardon. Jargon. Integrated Resource Framework, okay. which is an understanding of the consumption of resources mm. across health and social care. Okay. Um, and I think the key to this is the GPs, very much so, because the GPs at the end of the day make the decisions in the community about where patients will end up and they need to have confidence along with the members of our community about the alternative service provision that we're creating. So we have the confidence of some of our GPs, some of them are using a rapid response service. Um, that rapid response service is a multidisciplinary team. Um, it consists you know, nurses, OTs, social workers. Um, I mentioned earlier in the opening statement as well that there's um, some work that's being done through the development of a multidisciplinary team approach in Dundee and Angus, um, which is looking at further upstream the prevention of admissions when older people are uh, known to all services and as soon as there's any telltale signs that people are about to you know, go into decline, you know, the services get in there as quickly as possible, including geriatricians, I have to say, mm. are another key group. Mm. Um, because my experience is that geriatricians tend to attract people into hospitals. Geriatrician led that, that multidisciplinary team approach um, and we're seeing you know, real benefits in terms of redu reducing delayed discharge. And how, how long have you had this running now? Is it the last 12 months? Or? Well, that was over a winter period yeah. of uh, just a couple of months last winter. So okay. we would want to take that learning from Dundee and Angus and build on our rapid response approach in Perth and Kinross and try and you know, <coughs> take the learning from that in, into Perth and Kinross. But the, the really encouraging thing is because of the creation of that, that team and then linking it to the community, we've got a potent you know, um, combination of you know, people in a locality who are willing to discuss mm. the way that we want to change services in that mm. community. And, and I think it's the confidence, sorry, yeah. the confidence you get from communities to be able to change services mm. that will really see, see us in a strong position over the medium to long no, indeed, term. Indeed, I can entirely see that point. Um, could you just give from your perspective of the council, see how you feel GPs, I think, are coming down the journey that you describe? Um, Maybe I could get Mr Nicholl from the Tayside Health Board's perspective as well on that one too. Hopefully we'll be, we'll be seeing the same thing. Well, if you're the same thing, that would be very helpful. But, but um, not, not. <coughs> Bill and I have, have walked into surgeries with, with the, uh, the integrated resource framework data mm. and the GPs are, are very interested and the purpose um, was to stimulate their interest uh, and for them to see the impact, you know, financially, mm -hmm. you know, of their decisions. Um, it's a challenge in engaging GPs because of their workloads, because um, they may only be remitting one person a week from their surgery or two people to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So they don't, in their world, see this as a big problem. Small. It's yeah. the cumulative effect, Absolutely. I think, on, you know, the hospital system that they don't see from their own you know, GP surgery. So at the moment, we've began our journey um, on creating these multidisciplinary teams in Highland Perthshire. We wish to roll that out across the rest of Perth and Kinross. But the critical factor is to have these teams working routinely with GP practices so that we can use the data. We have very rich data about, say, the top 10 consumers um, within that GP practice of health and social care. And what you tend to find is the top 10, the difference between the top 10 that are consuming resources through unplanned admissions, there are significant differences between them and people that have the top 10 social care input. Um, so that's the conversation yeah. that we've began with the GPs. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Bill might want to explain what we've done in terms of creating an engagement structure with the GPs. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm perhaps not as... Uh, I'm a bit more optimistic about the opportunities with general practice. The, the, the work that's been done around the quality in general practice work, the cluster, the, the, the GP clusters coming together and, and working together on uh, improving pathways is a good example of, uh, that links in very well to what John's described in terms of these locality multidisciplinary teams, the clusters of practices working together across um, their own locality is critical to success in my opinion. Um, and I think there are opportunities there that I'm beginning to see positively. There are opportunities within the the new contractual arrangements that are emerging, subject to agreement to these, around creating time is a big important factor, as many people have already said mm -hmm. in this debate, a uh, discussion uh, for GPs to be freed from the, the, the relentless slog of patients coming through the door and actually to look outside the, the practice at the, 
at the wider community and working with the resources in that community positively. So freeing up uh, GP capacity to do that, uh, having locality leadership within general practice, uh, having a focus on anticipated care planning is all part of what's happening. And I think the, the key information summary system that actually provides information to GPs on people with anticipatory care plans and links that across the, the ambulance system through to acute is a good way of making sure that people who have anticipatory care plans don't finish up unnecessarily being hospitalised. So, so you think enough is happening within the current system to allow you to do what you need to do with GPs? I, 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 think, that, I think the framework is yeah. beginning to be put in place. I think a lot depends on agreement around these changes to the, the model of working within general practice and the, the amount of shift that there is. You know, without being disrespectful to my colleagues in general practice, we have practices who are within the same building, uh, and the only thing that they have in common is we've removed the need for one of the internal walls. You know, the, it's almost as simple as that. You know, that there are, we need to build general practice relationships with one another yeah. in order for them to work collectively Absolutely. with the wider system, and, and that's still a bit of work to be done. Okay. But these changes, I think, are, are good positive opportunities for us to build on that. Good. Okay. Thank you, Colin Beatty, Ken McIntosh. <coughs> Thank you, Vera. I wanted to pick up on uh, some comments that Mr Mayor made. Um, it was in relation to paragraph 28 of the Auditor General's report regarding the limited evidence of progress in moving money from institutional to community care. <coughs> I took the point that Mr Mayor made that, uh, in a way, standing still is almost progress. However, since 2004, it's been the policy of the Scottish Government to move resources away from uh, a, a sort of central, centralised provision of services, institutionalised service, out into the community. And the implication of what Mr Mayor said seemed to indicate that that wasn't happening to any huge degree. And we're now 10 years down the line where successive governments have had this policy. And I just wondered what evidence do we have this has actually been achieved? Can I perhaps just clarify, I wasn't saying there had been no shift. I, say, I think what I was saying was that, that savings in one area alone would not allow you to develop the capacity of community services uh, uh, to, uh, you know, to deliver against the demographics. So there, there's a limited extent to which, I mean, and I, I'm, quite, I'm not quite sure why I'm being sympathetic towards the hospitals and so on, but, but, but a, there's a limited extent to which we're going to be able to close hospital wards. And, and, it's, and it's not deemed uh, a great vote winner by most politicians either. So, so there is a real challenge about are we going to be able to release resource from the, from the hospital sector to fund the development of home care services. And indeed, care homes, I, frankly, I don't see care homes as being institutional care. They're care in homely settings within the community. Uh, so if we're, going to, uh, if we're going to develop our infrastructure of provision uh, within communities, then there may need to be additional resource found to build up that infrastructure. Uh, I don't think we can rely, and I don't think there's evidence from the change fund that we can rely on uh, downsizing of the hospital sector to fund the level <coughs> of development that will be required in the, in, the, in, 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 in the community. But I'm sure my colleagues are bet more able to make that argument than myself. Mr Nicol. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I think the issue here is a, a, a timing issue. Uh, uh, you know, if you go back to the example of mental health, um, we were able to demonstrate over time uh, a big reduce in demand for uh, inpatient care for people with mental health problems by expanding the community base of the service. And we did that on a permanent basis, uh, a once, and, once and for all. We used the bridging finance to actually pay for the double running costs of the hospital while that effect was taking place and we could see the evidence that these beds were no longer required in the system. If I could make a suggestion, uh, or perhaps an example, I'm going back to a question that was posed before about where we can see a real trade-off here. Um, so the example would be in, in the Strathmore area within Perth and Kinross. The staff uh, came to uh, myself and, and my colleagues uh, to say, um, we have an inpatient dementia assessment unit within the community hospital. Um, we're seeing on average six patients coming in. They're not really coming in for an inpatient assessment. Uh, they're coming in because the, the beds are there. Uh, there are you know, hundreds of people with dementia out there in the community that we're aware of 
uh, we believe that we should redesign ourselves as a community-based team, and, and, they, and, and we supported that process. It was challenging because of concerns about the impact that it would have on the hospital, uh, but the staff went out there. They're now delivering one of the, the, the best dementia care services anywhere uh, because they're now seeing the patients where they exist most of the time, which is out there in the, the community. No one is arguing to reinstate those beds because now they have the very best possible uh, dementia care service. And we're looking to scale that up. So my message really is there are opportunities where we start to redeploy acute uh, resource into the community. Not, let's not start with this difficult process of closing beds. Let's take geriatricians out into the community. Uh, let's have a community facing acute sector in the first instance that starts to work with a community base and has a common interest in, in a change of um, approach, a change of profile for uh, the way in which people are being looked after. So my message would be let's start a transition from the acute sector out the way to become community facing and start to mobilise some of the resource out the way rather than starting with a big ticket issue around beds. Thank you, it's, not, it's not just about beds and reshaping the current resource. The reality is in, in those 10 years when that statement has been made more times than any of us would care to count that we need to shift the balance of care and reshape care. In every financial year, the drive for board's financial planning has been acute access targets, new drugs, reducing waiting times and all of those things, which all cost money. It costs money to improve cancer services. It costs money to give patients access to more IVF, insulin pumps, or, you know, the list goes on. So there, there has been a gap between the political priorities quite legitimately to improve acute care and improve access to acute care and an agenda which is also about rebalancing care because you it's very difficult to do both in a relatively constrained financial climate. And I think, as I was listening to Annie talking about the, these kind of low-level community supports, it perfectly illustrates the fundamental problem, which the NHS has had since 1948, is what is the balance between prevention and looking after the people who are already ill? And the kinds of services Annie was describing, if you went back 15 years, councils funded. And we're in this cycle where those services all got cut as council budgets came under pressure and demand from more um, high need older people rose and now we're trying to reinvent them but then the change fund will change and we'll disinvent them again so we, we, we do need a kind of coherent approach over time that says what does prevention deliver and what does it really deliver and how do we protect cash <coughs> for it because right across services prevention is being squeezed keep well is being finished um, over the next two or three years which provides prevention primary care my own view is, I have to say, we're a part company with Bill slightly, is I do think the fact that around 10% of Scotland's acute beds are filled with delayed discharges is actually quite a good place to start because it's a terrible failure for the individual older people and it does cost a lot of money. So it's not the be-all and the end-all, but actually focusing on that single issue and trying to resolve it is part of the route to actually creating some wriggle room on resources, which is fundamental to developing the kind of infrastructure that, that delivers prevention. And I think the, the audit report highlights the lack of clarity about outcomes. We've always had the view that delayed discharge bed days should be a key outcome for older people because it has a whole series of consequences for patients. The number delayed over two weeks or four weeks, yes, it's important, but it's not the big driver of resources. It's the total bed days that's the big driver of resources. And if we focused on one thing for the next couple of years, because sometimes we have to focus on so many hundreds, then actually dealing with that problem, I suspect, certainly in our board area, would enable us to, to try and address some of the other things that people are talking about today. David Williams. Uh, convener, thank you. Uh, I, I, I think that last comment from Ms Renfrew around about outcomes is absolutely critical uh, in relation to how we continue to deliver services uh, and uh, the emphasis on it within the uh, uh, integration uh, uh, proposals and, and expectations over the course of the next year are central to where we should go. I'm very clear uh, in, from, a, from a Glasgow perspective that uh, probably too much of the social work services budget in Glasgow is spent on uh, uh, intensive uh, reactive crisis intervention provision uh, 
uh, and that's reacting as much to the delayed discharge issue as, as much as anything else, and then retaining and maintaining uh, citizens uh, in service level of provision at the level that they were uh, provided for at the point that they came in. And that's why the, it, there is an importance on uh, things like reablement and step down and developing and creating that, uh, what I'm terming uh, locally in Glasgow within my own department, uh, a th that throughput mentality. Uh, because the issue uh, of, of early intervention and prevention uh, is absolutely right. We, I need to find a way within Glasgow, and I'm quite clear about uh, uh, our responsibilities and our direction of travel uh, within social work services as part of the partnership that my responsibility uh, is to rebalance uh, the, the, the social work services budget so that there is a greater level of uh, availability for the funding of early intervention and prevention. It stands to reason, uh, it seems to me, that at the, this moment in time, and some of the elected members around the table will... Uh, have experienced this uh, in their letters to me around about lengthy waiting times for uh, elderly pay, uh, service users for occupational therapy uh, assessments, for instance. Uh, and uh, it stands to reason that uh, for people who have got re uh, what are considered low-level occupational therapy uh, need that they can wait for an assessment for a number of months uh, that if we can provide something for those people at an earlier stage then their situation and their circumstances are less likely to deteriorate which means that uh, they're not likely to end up causing ourselves health uh, a greater level of cost at the point that we do actually get to them so uh, Annie's comments around about the evaluation of low uh, low-level early intervention prevention is right. It's, it's indefinable to a certain extent, but logic tells you uh, that if you don't get to people who have got I clearly identified uh, OT needs or uh, other kinds of dependencies uh, quickly enough, then they will deteriorate and cost us more uh, at a later point. Okay, thank you. Annie and then Ken McIntosh. Um, thanks, Convener. Just, just another couple of quick comments on, on this issue of hospital closure, because not, not for the first time the, the model, the kind of 1980s model has been raised, you know, mental health, psychiatric hospital closure, learning disability, hospital closure. And, you know, yes, yes, we were able to do that, but there were three preconditions for that. One was the bridging finance, which we've already heard about. Two was very serious levels of investment in third sector alternatives. I mean, if you look at who, was, who it was, that, that was supporting people coming, you know, who would otherwise have gone to Gogoburn, and who would otherwise have gone to Lennox Castle. That was all person-centred, third sector, pretty much, provision. But the third thing, I think, and this brings me on to, um, back to Katrina's point about um, delayed discharge, there was a really strong social movement behind those hospital closures because it was seen as, a, as an absolute social scandal that people had to stay in hospital when they did not need to. Um, now, you know, with, with, with all the... All the shiny new equipment and fabulous new hospitals and, and the way that's kind of puffed up, that, 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 that does not exist at the moment. That doesn't p pertain. Um, and my sense is that it, it will need to. Um, and, and, and there's a kind of public reorientation about some perceptions around services as well that needs to go on. Ken McIntosh and then Mary Scanlon. Thanks, Convener. It's very much on the same subject. Uh, I also put up in your comments, Mr Mayor, about uh, you, you twice had to, I think, uh, I suppose, correct expectations. I think your opening statement you said... Uh, we're not going to empty hospitals, we're just going to stop building new ones. And then you said, we're not going to make any saving in the acute sector. So is it either an implicit or an explicit assumption about the reshaping change agenda that it will save money in the acute sector? Yeah. I, I, again, I think my, my view on that would be that it's saving money it's saving the additional money we would otherwise have to spend. I think we do have to have investment in community provision, both uh, care at home services, community capacity development, care home provision, and so on. That will reduce what will otherwise be an overwhelming demand on the acute sector. So it's, uh, I, my only point on this uh, has been that I, I, I simply didn't think we could rely on the saving, savings being made year on year uh, up front by the acute sector in order to fund those developments. Although taking Bill's point, I think shifting some of the acute sector uh, uh, resource out into the community itself is a good thing. Uh, you know, we need to support 
people, I mean, it, uh, the, the other big area where I think there's huge progress to be made, some has been made, but more progress to be made, is around palliative and end-of-life care. We should, not be, we should not have the numbers of people going, dying in hospital that we do. Uh, and choosing to go into hospital to die, that, there is a conversation to be had with the public about where's the best place to die. Uh, and, and how do we resource the capacity to support people to die at home or in, 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 in care settings uh, appropriately in the community and take some of that burden off the hospital. So all I'm saying is I think the, dri the driver for this cannot come from immediate savings, immediate reductions in beds. I hope over the piece there will be mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a reduced demand on the acute sector. If we, if we manage to refocus care, if we manage to shift the balance. Uh, but I think we're going to have to develop capacity to do that, and that may need in itself some shift. Some of that can come from within the existing pots. The other agenda, which I mean, I've been very consensus-oriented this, this morning so far, uh, uh, but, I mean, obviously the balance between... Uh, uh, lo local authority delivered care and, and care delivered by the third and independent sector is an area where uh, uh, there could be significant saving. Uh, I have some concerns that in p places the change fund has been used to, to protect high cost public sector uh, uh, jobs and that, that wasn't its purpose. I think market facilitation, diversification and choice are important as well. Uh, but, but I do think we will have to target development at community level to build up that capacity without that being dependent on having in the initial, initially achieved the savings to, uh, at, the, at the acute sector to create the shift. Well, perhaps I just ask for uh, other comments on this. It, yeah. It's really, does there need to be greater political uh, leadership or clarity in this? Because it's quite clear you've identified, I think, because General has identified bed blocking and Bill Nicol identified um, dementia beds that we need and Mr Mayor has just identified palliative care, all of which are fine, but the driver here is nothing, none of these. The driver of these is trying to control spending. It's the, the fact is that the Auditor General said that the rise in spending is unsustainable and specifically says there's limited evidence of progress in moving money, moving money, not creating new money, moving money to community-based services. Now, there's an implication in my mind, and it seems to be from all your comments, that actually money will be moved from the acute sector, in particular from the hospital sector, to the community sector. Now, is that, should there be greater clarity that that will not happen? Because it's quite clear from what you're saying that there may be, that may be a long-term um, outcome but it doesn't seem to be even uh, possible in the short term, perhaps. I, I, I struggle to agree with what Ronald's saying. I mean, I, I don't see how you can argue when 10% of Scotland's hospital beds today are filled with people who should not be in hospital, that you can't actually reduce the costs of acute care in a, in a reasonably short term way by reinvestment. I, I can't understand the, the, the logic which lies behind that statement. I think if you talk... So, you, our, so if you, if you, you think that 10% of saving, there could be a 10% saving in hospital beds? It's, it's, it's self-evident that those, those people, those are people, if you like, who are uncontroversial, that local social work services, the local health services, the consultant who's responsible for them have all agreed don't need to be in hospital. So they're not the people who you're talking about avoiding admission or trying to turn around or doing anticipatory care. They're trapped in acute hospitals because other care is not available. Now, putting the other care in place has hugely challenged us because, in a sense, the change fund has been bridging. It was new money, and, and we haven't actually... We, as I said, we have actually reduced delayed discharge bed days, and I think other boards may have as well. But we haven't made that systemic change. And I, I really empathise with David's point about waiting times. We still have a culture for older people that waiting's OK. In most of the health service, we've got off that. We've actually said, you don't wait for a scan. You don't wait for an assessment. You actually get it when you need it because that's the way to run an efficient system is that people get the assessment and the care close to the point they need it, not that we have an acceptability of waiting times. And some local authorities for aids and adaptations, as an example, probably of people waiting for a year, and that's a kind of acceptable <coughs> norm. It wouldn't be acceptable for anything in the health service now because we've really ham hammered down waiting times, which is a positive thing. So 
there's, a, there's an easy piece of acute that needs to be sorted. And I mean easy in the sense that it's easily identifiable. Solutions may not be easy. If you talk to our acute care doctors, including geriatricians, they will tell you there are large numbers of patients who are in acute hospitals because we don't have systems to care for them in other ways. Palliative care is one example. The number of bed days consumed by people in our health board who've come into hospital to die is, again, a massive number. So I, I do think there's an opportunity to radically reshape acute care. It's not the only solution because the demand, the demographics, the pressure on social care budgets is bigger than that. But I, I certainly wouldn't accept a view that the acute service reductions <coughs> Is, is, uh, is not part of the solution. I think the issue about political leadership is fundamental because hospitals are very precious to people. Bed numbers have become a huge issue in Scotland. You know, baselines of bed numbers, a bit like policemen on the beat or police people on the beat. Um, so some clarity that if you want really good community care for older people, most older people don't want to be in hospital, then there has to be a radical change to the way hospitals operate in order to be part of delivering that is a really important message. So okay, I can see everybody's wanting to. No, come in. we don't have time to. Well, okay, well, <laughs> to do that. So. Well, well, there's, there's, there's two other points I wanted to make. I would, uh, Mr. Mayor made a bid for some of your money, Mr. Williams. I could be wrong, but. Uh, but uh, <laughs> well, well, that's what I was going to say. That, that was that was what I was going to point out. The, the Auditor General, in, 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 in her report, points out that uh, uh, council spending on social care services rose between 2002 and 2009 by about 40 percent to 1.33 billion. But between 2009 and 2012, it fell to 1.26 billion. So um, how, how can we make this change in reshaping care when your budget is falling? Is it, is, does your budget need to increase or is, or is it something you can do? Uh, I, I think there's probably a number of things in there. I, the, Ranald said at the, the, the start around about the contribution that the independent and voluntary sector makes to uh, the provision of social care in relation to uh, Scotland's uh, citizens, uh, I think. Uh, and, but I think I want to qualify uh, the, uh, those statements to a certain extent because the overwhelming majority of funding uh, for the provision of those services comes directly from local authorities uh, and uh, the NHS, uh, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. So there is all, uh, and in terms of uh, Glasgow City Council social work services, uh, uh, approximately two thirds uh, of uh, the budget that uh, social work services has uh, is invested directly in purchasing services from uh, the private uh, and the voluntary sector. Uh, so that, that, that is somewhere in the region of £300 million. Uh, the market share that Glasgow City Council has in relation to the provision of residential care uh, in, uh, is somewhere of uh, the order of 15%. Uh, we purchase at any given point uh, in the city somewhere in, in the order of 4,000 uh, beds for all the people at any day, on any given day. Uh, and uh, and, I, and that's way above the uh, national averages, if you like, per, of per head of population. Uh, and in comparison to somewhere like Manchester, uh, there is a, a, a level of about 2,000 beds being purchased uh, at any given point. So uh, Glasgow is an outlier, in, and, and a lot of the stuff that, that's been presented by Audit Scotland hi highlights uh, what that Glasgow is an outlier. Now, there are, uh, re there's reasons behind that, which I think is around about uh, the so social and economic circumstances within the city and the de level of dependencies uh, and the level of need for uh, health and social care uh, at an earlier age. Uh, or, or, or for people uh, than perhaps uh, in other parts of the country. Uh, so demand has uh, continued to be uh, greater. But I think in terms of uh, how we uh, create uh, the environment where we uh, shift resource in order to assess the, the developing <coughs> of a different culture uh, and a different service environment, uh, we, we, we do need to uh, address uh, the numbers of uh, people who uh, come into uh, residential and nursing care. Uh, and that's also to complement some of the things that Katrina was talking around about and, and uh, Ranald himself talked about in, in relation to things like palliative care. Uh, you know, people actually do want to die uh, in their own homes uh, 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 rather than be uh, placed in, in residential nursing care uh, or hospital. Uh, Annie uh, mentioned earlier on the issue of uh, public, uh, a public re-engineering or a re-engineering of public expectation uh, of what 
services can provide. And I think that that is uh, a pretty fundamental issue about what it is uh, that we uh, collectively as a partnership uh, with service users, uh, individuals and families uh, can actually deliver going forward. That's reasonable rather than there being a continued expectation on, on our sector. Yeah, thank okay. you. Mary Scanlon. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can I first of all see if I actually find it quite depressing that we're sitting here 15 years uh, after we started talking about integrated care working and I could actually be sitting here in 1999 along with the convener because that's exactly what we heard from 1999 to 2002 and it is depressing sitting here today hearing about promoting integrated team working. However, <laughs> that's my, I've got that off my chest. Can I just go back to Mr Nicholl and Mr Walker? And it was actually a point that you made about the three, Angus, Dundee and Perth, and I'm from that area, I understand it very well. Um, but when you talked about the inequalities in Dundee, and I, I understand and completely accept that. But I think given the, the picture that you've given us and given the, the accepted inequalities, I would have expected a difference in the average number of home care hours in Dundee compared to Perth, and I would have also expected the spending on home care for older people, given what you both said, to be significantly different. In actual fact, there's about half an hour of difference, Perth 7.8 average home care hours, Dundee 8.4, and the percentage, the spending of home care on older people, uh, Dundee City 9.6, Perth 9.3. So, given the point you made to the convener, emphasising and totally accept the inequalities in Dundee compared to Perth and Kinross, why is there no difference in the hours allocated and the percentage share of the budget? If I can take the, 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 the hours allocated, um, I think there's maybe a couple of things at play here. Um, people live longer in Perth and Kinross as a result of that difference that we've just been speaking about. Um, we've also, like David in Glasgow, introduced reablement, um, and that has resulted in 40% um, of our older people who come through reablement being diverted from the dependency of home care services that otherwise would have been the case under our old traditional model. So we've completely transformed our home care services, and that's allowed people to um, live more independently, be given an intensive um, period of home care support, but many of these people are on reduced hours now. And that's enabled us to sustain our services through a period of economic challenge. Um, and taking the second point, I think I can only ex um, explain that the reason for us perhaps being lower, um, again, is because of that, that reablement approach, investing in the, the third sector, um, creating a, a sense of well-being for people to live independently, um, but also um, because um, we, we'll, we, we will have reduced budgets over that same period because of the challenges that we've faced. Um, and some of that has been through um, use of um, commissioning contracts um, and, and using the, the third and independent sectors to provide care on a greater scale that, that, than we've had previously. I don't have time to drill further down on that. I've got another two questions to ask, but I, I don't find that an acceptable answer. But can we just move on? Uh, Katrina Renfrew uh, did say you need a coherent approach. Um, I'm sure you've all done your homework and uh, looked at uh, the Audit Scotland report. Um, the Exhibit 11, uh, the reshaping care uh, for older people, uh, brought out in 2010, it seems to me a reasonably coherent approach. There are, in fact, uh, eight commitments, three of which have been achieved. Um, I just want to ask about three of them, given that you're all stakeholders, as far as achieving these commitments. The first one is we will double the proportion of the total health and social care budget for older people that is spent on care at home over the life of the plan. In actual fact, it didn't double. It went down from 9.2 to 8.7. The change fund, and uh, various others have mentioned this, I think uh, Kenneth McIntosh perhaps said there was limited evidence about uh, more being spent on community-based services. Uh, commitment 3 states, as yet, there is no evidence 
that it has stimulated organisations to spend more. And the third point that concerns me as well is commitment seven. We will ensure older people are not admitted directly to long-term institutional care from an acute hospital. National data is not available. So as an audit committee for this parliament, do you understand how difficult it is, or perhaps I should say how difficult it is for Audit Scotland to try to present us with a report when, as stakeholders, uh, the information is not there for us to audit and monitor spending. So why, why, <laughs> why is the budget going down? Why is there no evidence um, on the change fund? And why is national data not available to measure uh, older people going into institutional care? I think for the first two, it's a conflation of all of the issues that we've talked about that, that increased spending on acute services, um, this whole dilemma about investing in prevention and early intervention versus dealing with older people who, who are already at the point in the system where actually institutional care is the only response. And, and if, you, if, if you're in hospital now, and you've actually had a significant health event and you need to go into a care home, you should be able to get one. It shouldn't be driven by, well, well the policy is you can't because, you know, you have to go somewhere else first. And I, I think a number of health boards always challenged that proposition that no one should go from hospital to a care home. If you've had a massive stroke and are very disabled and are never going to be live independently, why should we not allow you to go to a care home that's your final destination? But the first two, I think, is the conflation of all of the issues we've talked about. Just saying the, the data's not there. I, I suspect you know, individual councils may have the data, and, that, uh, well, and, uh, and I would imagine hospitals do. So I can't, I, I can't be certain why that information is not available. We certainly collect the data about where people are discharged to. So I would have thought hospital data would tell you how many people had gone straight from so hospital to care home. When comes in, then are you saying the Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board? Has that information? I, I believe we would have that information because we know the destination of discharge for patients from hospital. <coughs> so we, I'm happy to look at that and see if we can produce something for you. Well, can, well it's not just for us, it's for, for Audit Scotland. Yes. So yeah. um, can you ensure, firstly, that the information, if it hasn't already been provided, is provided both to ourselves <laughs> and to Audit Scotland? And also, if it hasn't been provided, given that you say that it exists, tell us why it hasn't been provided. Sorry, Mary. No, my second, second point. Well, can I just talk about government commitments? And I support this. Sorry, commi just before that's another point. No, no, it's exactly. It's, it's a double. Going to get Ronald Mayor in. All right, it was double the budget. Right, okay. Uh, and in fact, the budget's gone down. And, and I've heard you so often talking to colleagues, uh, Ms. Renfrew, about the acute sector. I understand all that. But this is also a commitment. So is it a lesser commitment or is it a commitment that was easy to, to ditch. This is a commitment made, I would imagine, by cross-party support to double the proportion spent on health and social care, but you're saying the acute sector needs the money, therefore it can't happen. I, I, don't, I don't think that's what, what I was trying to express. What I was trying to express, there are also a whole series of commitments, some of them made in legislation, for example, about waiting times that require major investment. So I suspect one of the challenges is that there are a whole series of commitments that are made in policy terms that in a time of constrained finance are difficult actually to honour across the piece. And certainly from our financial planning point of view, there, are, there has been significant investment in acute services to meet commitments that have been made um, in, in, in other processes than reshaping care for older people. Yeah, I think that's also something that we could probably direct to the accountable officer yeah. in the, the Scottish Government. Ranald Mayor. It's just quickly on two points. One, to agree with Katrina on seven about the discharge, nobody to be discharged from hospital to care homes. That was frankly nonsensical. Uh, I, I mean, we understood where it was coming from, that people should go from hospital back from whence they came. But to send people home to fail in order then to access the resource they need is it would be, be appalling. Uh, so the fact is we have to have correct assessment about who is able to be re, subject to reablement and be supported to go back home and who frankly is going to need long-term care. And we have to be able to do that uh, through multi-disciplinary uh, assessment in the hospital context and get it right. We shouldn't be, yes, people shouldn't be coming into care homes if they 
have the potential to go back home, but nor should they be going back home if, 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 if it's very clear that what they need is long-term care. So it was, not a, it was not a good target, in my view. Um, certainly, we do need more investment in, in home care. Uh, and, you know, yesterday we saw the, the start of the implementation of self-directed support. We want to give people more choice and more control over the care options they have access to. Um, and, I mean, I think, we, we, it, it, because when you drill into those figures, which Mary, you were talking about, is actually, even within the spend, what we're seeing is a smaller number of people having higher amounts of input in home care, but actually a reduced number of people overall having care at home. That if the goal is to maintain people with support, and particularly that earlier intervention to support people, uh, then actually we're not investing in the, in the right areas. Clearly, it's another one of those areas where there are some tensions in some areas between in-house provision. I mean, so the fact that Glasgow has 97% of home care, including all the reablement care delivered by uh, its arm's length uh, in-house body, is, 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 may or may not either give the citizens of Glasgow choice or uh, the best use of public monies, but it's a political uh, d decision which, which, which is made. Uh, so it, there are some issues about could we spend the home care pot more efficiently, but probably we have to simply make sure that the pot increases, which is, I think, the, the point you're drawing attention to. Right. My, my, my final question is, if we can look at, it's Exhibit 6 and it's page 21. I'm looking at Care Homes, Home Care and Other. <laughs> From 2009-10, the budget has been falling, and I understand the trend is still downwards on those three uh, sectors of social care. If we go uh, back to Exhibit 1, we've got the over 65 population increasing from between 13.6 in Glasgow to 22.2% in Dumfries and Galloway uh, between now and 2035. So the trend is a falling budget and around a 20% increase, uh, increase in population which I think is fair to say will lead to an increase in demand for services. How do we manage, uh, how do we look after older people? How do, we, how, do, how do we meet the increased demand with a decreased supply of money? Money. On the head, Mary, I would say. Sorry? Um, I think you've hit the nail on the head there, really. Um, one, one point I wanted to make in relation to the, the fall in spend is that you wouldn't necessarily equate that with a fall in volume because um, something else that's been happening in care at home services, as I think colleagues are well aware of, is the way that the price for that care at home provision has been driven down uh, to the point at which uh, care at home for older people uh, outside of direct delivery by local authorities is now kind of inching its way towards a minimum wage occupation uh, where people don't get paid for travelling from one of their customers to the next, 15-minute um, care visits on the increase, being commissioned, all that kind of stuff as well. So I think when we, when we look at kind of cost and volume of home care, we need to keep our eye very, very firmly on quality because I think that will be another driver for increased acute care demand. Um, if we're not actually providing a good quality of care. So I think there are, there's, there's more to these figures than, than may meet the eye. David Williams. Uh, thank you, convener. The, uh, I, I think that's right. I mean, I think there is an issue around about uh, the, the. I suppose it's about the assumptions in some respects as well, and in terms of particularly the the first uh, commitment uh, around about doubling the proportion of the total health and social care budget for all the people spent on care at home uh, over the lifespan of the plan. What what I've what we've talked about are uh, and relates to the, the hitting the nail on the head point that Annie made. Uh, what we need to do is be able to make sure that the money that we have uh, available to us is used as efficiently and as effectively as we possibly can do. Uh, and so we have made reference through the course of the morning on, uh, for instance, reablement, uh, which has uh, demonstrated unequivocally that people are receiving home care for less lengths of time 
uh, than would historically have been the case, uh, and that's been sustained. So whilst uh, that, so that in in essence will mean that spend will uh, not increase necessarily, and it will reduce. Uh, there is uh, a very clear case to argue uh, about how we do things differently, uh, which I think will substantially address uh, the points that you make around about uh, reducing public funds and increasing demand. I, I'm not familiar with uh, reablement, so could you send us uh, maybe a short written briefing on exactly what it is and what it does? Um, can I ask you, however, you've said that one of the challenges is to um, use the resources efficiently, effectively, you know, get the best value. Um, is it the case, though, that um, you are able to meet the needs of both the elderly and you know, other sectors of the population in Glasgow who need care services? Are you able um, to meet their needs to acceptable standards within existing budgets? Uh, at this moment in time, I'm, I'm confident that we have been meeting uh, uh, people's needs uh, to the best of our abilities within the resources. Uh, I think there so, are sorry, issues... what does to the best of your abilities mean? Well, it, uh, there's a fixed amount of money that I have got available to me as the Director of Social Work. Yeah, yeah, but the question, that... yeah but, forgive me, but the question I asked is, are you able to meet the needs of all those people to acceptable standards rather than are you able to do what you can within yeah. the budget? I've already indicated earlier in the, in the session that I think it's unacceptable that people wait for very lengthy periods of time for, for instance, OT assessments. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's been a situation that has been in place for a very long time so uh, in Glasgow. So I need to change that. So there are elements of uh, what we are doing uh, that need to be improved. But can that, done, can that be done within existing budgets, or is there more money required? And this is not just about what you do in Glasgow, yeah. because it you know, seems to be a comment coming across. Is there more money required to provide the level of services that the elderly uh, and others in the population who need care require? Uh, I'm uh, not going to say that we would not need more money. Uh, uh, the resource allocation, uh, you know, that argument's been played out elsewhere uh, in, in political terms, uh, uh, and very clearly that's impacted on my uh, budget uh, within social work services over the course of the last uh, uh, short number of years in particular, uh, and uh, that money would always be able to be directed more effectively, more efficiently, if it were available. Okay, Katrina Renfrew and Bank of Scanland. Maybe help, David. We, we work with six local authorities. I think they all have substantial pressures on their social work budgets, and if not all overspent, all are, have got those pressures. So there is clearly more demand for social care, and it's not just adults, of course, it's children as well, than that there is cash in fixed budgets to deliver it. And I think our concern is that going into the new partnerships from April 2015, that if we can't reach agreement with councils about a, a, a realistic level of funding to open those new partnerships, we'll immediately run into problems um, in those partnerships being able to meet their obligations. So councils around our area, and I suspect in other parts of Scotland as well, I think we'd accept they, they are not able to put the money into social care budgets or are overspent on social care budgets. They are not able to put the money in that, that, that needs to meet demand. And I think Part of this whole issue that we've touched on, and I'd just like to make sure we don't lose, because it is picked up in the audit report, is the costs of the workforce. And I agree with Annie. I think the real risk around quality of what we've done with the National Care Homes contract has driven down price or contained price, potentially at the cost of quality, particularly for people with dementia, and certainly at the cost of getting a dedicated and committed and career-shaped workforce. And I think the same is... Is, is true in other services. So part of our perfect storm is we're actually not paying a lot of the workers who deliver this care um, a reasonable living wage. In fact, we're not paying the living wage, as the audit report says. So I would avoid this race to the bottom where we say the council provided services are expensive. They're more expensive largely because the employees have actually got the kind of package of pension, sick pay and benefits that actually should be the minimum rather than some kind of aspirational level. So I, I do think we need to be quite careful about that race to squeeze the workforce costs um, in terms of quality. Okay, thank you. 
Mary Quinn, it, was Mary it, it, it was exactly on that point. I mean, I've, I've just listened to everyone talking about, you know, to ensure that people get the quality of care uh, and also to watch the money. I'm probably more familiar with the Dundee and Angus uh, than Glasgow, but uh, I am aware that you pay 80% more per person per week uh, funding in a council home than you do in the independent sector. So put simply, for three people in a council home, you could have five in the independent sector. Uh, my understanding is that, well, not my understanding, but the care inspectorate, the quality standards are the same. So I take what Katrina says, but you know, given that we're looking at the same quality standards, how can you justify 800 and sometimes over a thousand pounds a week uh, for a council uh, placement and 500-ish in the independent and the third sector that uh, Annie Gunner mentioned? I can't speak on behalf of Dundee and Angus. I work for well, Perth can, and Kinross Council. Well, I'm, not familiar, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that, that, that market, but I know that the difference in you know, Perthshire is not as marked as what you seem to be indicating there, Ms Scanlon. Um, Dundee's 80%. Um, I know that... Um, this comes down to um, choice at the end of the day because it's, um, it's those people that are moving into their homes and their loved ones that ultimately make the decision um, and how the market works. Um, and in Perth, um, or well, Perthshire, um, we are actually over-endowed with capacity in terms of older people's homes. And some of our operators are struggling, quite frankly, um, because of that. You know, there's about 54 care homes in, across Perthshire. Um, so, you know, we, we operate three care homes as a council and we operate within that market and we've had to adjust um, to these market pressures as well. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's just some of the background perhaps to explain, you know, where we are in Perth and Can Ross. Okay, thank you. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. I'd, I'd like to just tease out one or two more of the issues on delayed discharge with you. I've heard quite a number of comments that have been very, very helpful. It's just to get some of your your further thoughts on it. In the Auditor General's report, uh, she noted that the, I mean, the problem does seem to have improved since 2007. It's, it's almost half uh, the size that the problem was then, but, but still we have over 300,000 days that are unnecessary by people aged 75 or over. So, I mean, there's a, there's a huge cost attached to that, clearly. And, and, I, and I've heard some of the ideas, and David mentioned, I think you talked about the step-down process and and so on and so forth. And I think, uh, was it Bill that mentioned, mentioned an improved discharge pathway? Um, so will we ever get this down to zero? Is that a realistic proposition? Where are the barriers to, to getting that down further? And where are the opportunities for us to, to gain from this? Because I'm not... I don't think if we got that down to zero, we wouldn't save all of that money because it would be transferred, basically. The cost of that care would be transferred into the, the community as a result, I presume, by that. So what are the barriers to improving this and where are the biggest opportunities for gain for us? And really any of the panel... Ranul Mayor. I mean, just briefly to say, I mean, David put the emphasis on step-down care, how we get people out of hospital more quickly, and I think that's, that's important. However, I do think there is an importance to actually avoiding people going in in the first place. I mean, I, they, they won't be delayed <laughs> if they are not in there. Uh, that's, you know, that, so uh, I think alternatives to hospital are important. I do think step-up provision, so non-hospital-based -hosp Care that may still be under the oversight of a of a geriatrician uh, or a, or GPs, uh, but I think care in other settings, whether it's in somebody's own home with intensive home care or whether it's in a care home, is an important part of this. Uh, uh, that uh, so you, you you because often as we know, uh, the admission is triggered by something which does not necessarily require the high end clinical input of the hospital. That's not why the bulk of older people go into hospital. They go in for things which are relatively, in clinical terms, relatively straightforward and could be addressed either in their own homes or in other settings. So I suppose I simply want to bring us back to that part of the equation, that it's not all about what you do once somebody's in. It, it, it starts actually by trying to make sure that they don't go in unless they absolutely need the clinical inputs that you can only get from a hospital. Bill, what, Bill Nicol? 
Thanks, Kavina. Um Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree, first of all, with the point that Ranulph, uh, my colleague, has made just now. The um, hospitals are, are a, and this has been said many a time, a dangerous place for frail, vulnerable older people. We should not be admitting unnecessarily anyone to uh, an acute hospital who doesn't need to be there. And yet the, the day of care surveys that have been carried out, I think, in North Lanarkshire recently, it was indicated that something in region 25% of people at any one time perhaps didn't need to be there either because they were fit for discharge or it was deemed that they, 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 their admission was, uh, was avoidable. So, and, and I think that delayed discharge is, a, is a something of a national scandal that we need to address and, and, and it does need to get to as close to zero as we can manage. Um, and that's something that we are committed to try to achieve. Um, I know that some areas are getting close to that. The, the Cabinet Secretary quoted that West Lothian were perhaps closer to that than most areas. I, I don't know the facts of that, but it has to be an, an achievable goal for us uh, because it is a, a, something of a scandal. Our experience shows that improving the pathways for discharge is critical, uh, as well as that avoidance of admission and flow. So, for example, we made great inroads early doors with our change fund initiatives in Perth and Kinross. What we found was that uh, in some areas of Perth and Kinross, the um, not, you know, notwithstanding the work on reablement, there was still a need for much smaller packages of home care to sustain people beyond the reablement phase. And, and that was not necessarily always available in rural areas. And some providers finding it difficult for the same cost to go and provide a small package of care to somebody up in Rannoch or wherever. So what's been happening, another part of the reason, we continue to learn and add to what we're doing. So, so something that we've been working on to, to, to get that resolved in Perth and Kinross is using GIS data to try and map out the areas and actually have providers operating in, in areas and providing every package of care that's required um, in that particular area, whether it's a very small package. And that's what we should be aiming for. So reductions in home care uh, over time per, per person is a good thing because it means that people are being able to be reabled and sustained longer. And the points my colleagues have made about that being a reducing proportion. Some of the measures that we are looking at just now are perhaps the wrong measure. So we used to look at intensive home care packages as a strong measure. That's no longer the case. We wouldn't necessarily subscribe to the idea that 10 plus hours of home care per week was necessarily a, a, you know, a measure of, of effectiveness in providing the right uh, level of home care. So we want to, to try and uh, ensure that people can live uh, with as little uh, dependent care going into them as and into their support them as possible. Um, but one of the things we have to fix are some of these geographical, rural kind of challenges, and that would be the same in some parts of the city as well, I would think. But just try to make sure we've got that. So it's the flow that goes right through so people can quickly move right the way through. Every time you fix one bit, you can't afford to have another blockage somewhere else in that process. Otherwise, it, it backs right up and it causes a problem that you, you started with. And we found that and we're starting to fix it now. Hey, no, David Williams. Uh, I think there's a, a challenge facing us over the, uh, from April next year when we move to a two-week uh, time frame um, uh, because very clearly uh, uh, it will be uh, impossible for an assessment of community care needs uh, of an older person to be completed within two weeks. Uh, it, that's a, it's a process that takes longer than two weeks. So uh, there's a question in my head around about why have a target at all uh, and why not move to a point where uh, the point that somebody is deemed fit for discharge, that's actually the day that we should be striving to get people out of hospital. Uh, and uh, Katrina's already uh, alluded to the potential uh, avail release of resource that could come as a consequence of that, which would then uh, and could then be uh, contributing in some way towards uh, where uh, the alternative provision could be. Now, it may well be that not everybody clearly, uh, because of some of the circumstances that people have, could go home, but in relation to uh, some kind of interim uh, provision and in the form of step down or intermediate care, uh, it, it, I think we could uh, deliver very significantly uh, on the delayed discharge uh, uh, problem. Um, but I do think that requires uh, uh, a will from uh, local authorities, from health boards, uh, and from within the 
practice that goes on in both of those sectors uh, and politically uh, to en enable that change of thinking that says, I'm fit for discharge today and actually this is the day I want to go out of hospital. Okay, Willie Coffey. Right, see, see, in the main, are, are, are people um, admitted to hospital without a discharge plan and we don't know when they're coming back out? Is that, is that the norm? People are admitted and we don't know when they're coming back I out? I think you've hit on exactly the key issue. For, for the, way, the way to meet the two-week target is you start assessing people when they're admitted to hospital. Uh -huh. um, I often have a bet with my acute front door colleagues that if I sat in A&E, I could probably pick out 90% of the people who are going to need a social care assessment when they're sitting in A&E because the, the, the drivers for a need for at least a social care assessment are not exactly difficult to diagnose or difficult to, 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 to see in a patient. They are a fairly classic group of patients as they enter the hospital. So I think you hit the nail on the head. That The problem we have with delayed discharge is it's, it's become an accepted norm. So one of the issues we have with our acute hospitals is they don't drive hard enough to get delayed discharge patients out. It's become just part of everybody waits two or three weeks. Nobody goes home on the day they're actually ready for discharge because that, well, not, not older people. So there's a, there's a kind of cultural issue to be addressed, but, but certainly one of the drives we have is to get our staff to refer patients. The minute there is a possibility, they'll require social care, and the assessment starts long before they're ready for discharge, so they are discharged into an appropriate concluded place because they've been assessed as they've been recovering in hospital, not that the, the assessment starts once they've recovered. And that, to me, seems a fairly simple thing. I get frustrated, I have to say, with why it seems to be so difficult to do. Mr Walker was keen to... So. We, we've, we've been actually planning the discharge as soon as people come in at the hospital. Um, and just, to get, again, to, for some context, um, we roughly have about 500-odd people coming in unplanned admissions into Perth Royal Infirmary every month. And, and that's not actually wavered over the last few years. What has grown exponentially is the number of people that are coming on to the delayed discharge pathway. And that's been in the over 80 um, uh, group. Um, we have reduced delayed discharges by, you know, 33% over the last few years. And we're confident with the investment that the council's making quite separately from the change fund, I have to say as well. But we're confident if the change fund was to continue with the council investment, we'll meet the two-week target. Um, but um, my colleague Katrina is quite right. We need, to, we need to avoid people coming into hospital. It's about dealing with complexity within the community. And that's what we're trying to do in terms of growing um, the, uh, the expertise within the community to do that. Then once you do that, um, you're reducing the demand for beds. And then that opens up the opportunities to bring in the sort of health economics about, well, how much resource does that, that, that release? And also with the, the, the information we have through the integrated resource framework, we know what the average consumption is per capita in different parts of Persia. And while it's not a race to the bottom, this is just an example, um, if the three other localities, we've got four localities we look at in Persia, um, if three localities were to consume the same as the lowest per capita consumption, we would save in approximately the region four and a half million pounds. Now, that four and a half million pound is tied up in buildings, in staff. So, you know, the challenge is about, you know, exploring, you know, these economics and then looking at the opportunities that exist through our commissioning plans to unlock that, you know, that investment that's currently tied up. And I think that was the original question that you were asking. Mr. Mr. My, my very last point, that you, I mean, I'm mindful that we're the audit committee, we're not the health committee, and we're always interested in the flow of the money and the cost and so on. I mean, if the delayed discharge at the size of the problem, see, I've just done a quick calculation that it could be costing us up to 150 million quid a year or, or thereabouts. As an audit committee, I mean, if we get this problem solved as best we can, where is that financial benefit? Where does that go? Does that go? Does that effectively get spread into the community to provide the care service? Because I mean, presumably we will save a portion of that money if we solve this problem, or do we not? The, yeah, we will absolutely. The, the debate <laughs> will be. The, the debate will be. Are we allowed to close hospital beds because that's how you save the cost? And are we allowed to close hospital beds in an economic way, which? which may be a large part of a hospital rather than two beds in each hospital. So part of releasing the money is being allowed to change hospital services, um, which is always a challenge. The second issue is what other pressures are there in the acute sector and what other demands for new investment in acute are there. And the third point is that should go, in our view, 
into, into community care services. And by that, we mean that broadly. It should be into primary care, it should be into NHS community care and to, into social care. And our view is that that's what the integration joint boards cut going forward will do. That would be allocated into their budget on an agreed basis so they can look at that as a total part of their plan. And I think you've probably heard a number of comments about the risk changing the change fund creates. One of the things that needs to change about it is it needs to become core funding for the new integration joint boards, not a separate plan, not a separate stream of money, not a separate set of checking. It needs to be seen as part of the opening core budget the partnerships have got to try and solve some of these problems. Okay, that's very helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, can I ask Mr. Williams a question? You, you, you're talking about assessment, and, and also Katrina Renfrew uh, mentioned that you know assessment should really start when people go into hospitals. Um, is it the case that whether it's for someone in a hospital setting or indeed someone in the community who needs um, services from social care? Is it the case that a care plan is produced? Is that a requirement that a care plan is produced? At, at the conclusion of an assessment, yes. And should the individual be given a copy of that care plan? Uh, well, uh, the point's been made earlier on in relation to the uh, development of uh, or the, uh, the implementation of the self-directed support uh, legislation as of yesterday uh, and the clear expectation uh, in the development of that care plan is uh, a level of uh, a clear level of co-production with the service user and uh, 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 and their advocate, if you like. You see, it, it, it's my experience over a number of years, um, and, and, and indeed dealing with different local authorities, but the production of that care plan is not done either timidly. It's not done as a given, and very often the care plan is not provided unless the individual or their family requests that. I, I can actually cite current experience just now from a number of constituents. Um, but I, I, I don't assume that that's a particular problem with Renfrewshire. I, I think that's a, that there is an issue. And I know that there's, there are resource implications. I know that staff are, are burdened. But if there's a legal requirement to provide a care plan, why would it be that the local authorities are not providing that care plan uh, to the individual when the assessment is done? I would expect uh, individuals to be involved in the development of the care plan and for them to have a copy of that. Right, OK. Well, I can make further inquiries. Thank you. Uh, James Norman. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I'd like to ask David Williams a question and then uh, go on to the panel, if you don't mind. Uh, we've had quite a lot of discussion about sort of early intervention. You mentioned it yourself. We also we talked about, I think it was uh, Annie Gunnar-Logan that, that talked about the sort of uh, the low-level services and the impact that that could have on the well-being of elderly people. Can I ask, how does charging up to £15 a day in daycare services going to encourage people to take part in, in the daycare services? And is it not going to have a knock-on effect? Certainly, at least one a daycare in my constituency is talking about closing because they don't think they can afford, uh, their, their clients can afford to pay that money. Uh, there's a, a, a need for... Uh, Consistency in terms of uh, Glasgow City Council's approach to uh, the uh, contributions that uh, adults make to the receive, receipt of uh, the social care services that they uh, uh, receive. So, uh, for uh, a number of years, Glasgow City Council, uh, along with uh, many other local authorities, have had a charging policy for non residential services uh, uh, in place. Uh, we have, uh, as an authority, uh, been implementing uh, the personalisation uh, social policy direction of travel for the course of the over the course of the last three years uh, uh, amongst uh, the under 65 uh, adult age group, people with learning disabilities, people with mental health issues and physical disabilities, uh, and uh, we have applied uh, a charge for the receipt of services uh, to uh, them. Uh, the uh, enactment of the self-directed support legislation. Uh, necessarily required the Council to uh, include the older people in uh, our personalisation programme uh, and in, ensure, in order to ensure that uh, we were not discriminating uh, against uh, people who we have spent the last three years asking for a contribution for services, uh, we've had to apply a contribution uh, f uh, expectation on older people receiving uh, our community-based services as well. 
Uh, it's about consistency and it's about uh, ensuring fairness and equality uh, across the board. Yeah, the, the, this, this discussion, uh, neither this discussion nor this report, is about the specific charging policies of no, any one so council, and I'm not going to go no, down that it's route about at all. The, it's about the well-being of elderly people, and it's about. It's no. already been mentioned no, no, that daycares have an impact on the no, well-being no, of, of no, elderly no, people. No, no, I am not. And if the no. cost is putting off Sorry, people James. from going to daycare services, then no. it is. Can I just say, Mr Williams, that the civil service response, I've, the advice that I've seen, suggests that the SDS has got absolutely nothing to do with Glasgow City Council's decision to charge £15 a day. Well, anyway, this is not about what Glasgow City Council does. This no, is looking not. at an Audit Scotland report on the provision of services to older people across Scotland. And indeed, Glasgow will not be the only authority that's charging uh, for daycare services. So we're not going down that route. Sorry, do you want to come back to the... Yes, I do. I want to come back to the question I want to ask the committee. Uh, and Katrina Renfrew mentioned her concern uh, about the, the joint sharing of budgets, I think, was one of the things. I was on CHCP when I was a councillor, and I thought they did a lot of good work. And then they came to this blockage, which I think was pretty much round about the same thing, control and, and, and money. What work has been done already to, to redesign the services uh, for elderly people, given that uh, the, the, well, the public bodies joint working is going to be in place? We have, um, we have three existing integrated um, partnerships, um, as, as people may know, in Inverclyde, Weston Barton and East Renfrewshire. So they, the directors of them, soon to be chief officers, already hold health and social care budgets for the full range of health and social care, actually not just adults. We've arrived at a similar agreement with the City Council and a process is getting underway to establish the same arrangement, again, covering all social care services, not, not just adults. But the challenge will be agreeing an opening budget for that partnership. The Council will rightly challenge us about how much money we're putting in and transparency around that. And we'll challenge the Council in terms of spending versus budget and all of those issues. And I think the, the point I was trying to make is that those are going to be difficult discussions because of the, the pressures that are on not just Glasgow's social care budgets, but all social care budgets. And I think it's really important the new partnerships start with some chance of success, which does mean sorting out the money in a realistic way, which is not just going to be a local issue. I'm sure this is an issue across the whole of Scotland because I know councils across Scotland have pressures on social care budgets and a number of health boards have got significant spending problems as well. But if we try and start these partnerships short change, then they will fail because you can't actually tackle the agenda of redesign and improvement and the challenges that they face without actually having a reasonable financial proposition at the start of the process. This is clearly not just an issue, as you said, for, no. for Glasgow or no. uh, surrounds, but is there anybody else who would like to comment on the work that's been done to, to make sure these uh, systems are in place? Uh, from from Tayside perspective, uh, there, there's agreement still to be reached in terms of what the scope of the services would, would be within each of the partnerships, but there's real progress being made in formulating the, the partnerships in the three areas. Indeed, uh, my colleague John Walker has just been appointed as the interim chief officer for Perth and Canross, and, and we have arrangements in place for the, the three areas. Um, but the issues about actually putting the budgets together within the scope of services agreed is the easy bit. Uh, the challenges where you start to bend the spend and redirect the resource towards against a fairly tight overall resource. Um, and that's where the real challenges come in. And when organisation, host organisations supporting the partnerships come under pressure to make decisions about committing, let's say, more resource into uh, what's traditionally regarded as social care from health and so on and vice versa, these are where the real challenges will come along. I, I would go back to the importance of something uh, around the integrated resource framework and actually understanding that it's the whole resource that, that, that's being committed around the pathways of care that people have. That brings the acute sector in around the table as well. If we're going to make a success of this, we've all got to get agreement across the whole pathways for particularly older people uh, to realign uh, the resources in the most uh, effective way and put the resource where it needs to go. And that's where some of those tensions might come through and that's where I think it's important that we, that the voluntary nature of partnerships now need to move on to a much more legislative, uh, a much, much, much tighter framework uh, for going forward. And, and I think that's why it's important that the Parliament has started to make that, that those changes happen through the, through the new legislation. And, and I'm sure it'll make a significant difference having one person uh, with overall responsibility for 
the budgets working to a partnership uh, board and, and working with a single budget and with a single set of commitments to improve outcomes for older people and, and doing whatever it takes to, to make the money move to where the, the greatest need is and, and reprofiling that spend. And it will be difficult, but I feel more confident that we're now in a position where that becomes more of a reality than it was in the past. Okay, Annie. Um, thanks, convener. I, I just wanted to come back to something that Ronald said right at the beginning about who are the partners here, um, because we're, we're starting to go down the road of partnership being about councils and, and NHS boards, um, and, and, uh, and, and David and others have reminded us that, you know, yes, they've got all the money, but they don't have all the assets, um, and a lot of the assets are in the third sector, they're in the independent sector, and actually with older people themselves. Um, and, and I think we, we shouldn't lose sight of that. Um, it, it's interesting, I mean, Mary Scanlon said earlier on that, you know, here we are as stakeholders, and this is, this is kind of relatively new for us because we've, we've always been on the outside of this as a third sector. Reshaping Care was the first programme where the third sector actually became a partner and a stakeholder in the delivery. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm bound to say that all partners are equal but some might be more equal than others. Um, and, and, and in that respect, I, I would commend to the committee a couple of reports from, from the uh, project that I, that I mentioned earlier on, um, and I'll send the clerk a link to those electronically, um, because that, that has been quite difficult for us um, to, to, make those, to make those arguments. But um, certainly in relation to older people, I think there needs to be much more consultation and participation with local groups representing those older people and, and it's not just about high level strategic budget finagling that's that's going on here this needs to be linked very very directly back into the needs of older people and their views um, and, and how they want to reshape care um, so i just kind of want to make that point really okay james uh, thanks very much for that i, I wonder are you getting a sense even at this early stage that you are being involved in the process and that it's not going to be a case of the two big beasts Fight it out or well, there's, there's, been, there's been some progress things. around reshaping care with that. I mean, there's two, there's two elements really. One, one is the involvement of the third sector in the planning structures, in the strategic commissioning groups, and that's 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 quite positive, I think. Um, and, and, and some uh, some good progress has been made there. The, the, the second bit is the involvement of the third sector in supporting older people, um, which is not quite the same thing. Um, uh, and perhaps <coughs> less, some progress, but less. And as I said before, once the change fund ends, you know, we might we might be waving cheerio to some of some of that provision that, that's already established. Um, I mean, I, I'd, wa I'd want to make the point, um, just because I can, uh, that the reshaping care partnership, which, it, which is this four-way partnership, is not being carried forward into the integration partnerships under the Public Bodies Bill. That's, that's still very much a kind of two-way. We hope that it will carry on, but legislatively it is not a requirement, um, and I think that's a shame. David Williams. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I, I think we shouldn't lose sight of, uh, the, uh, and, and I don't mean this in the wrong way, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there are two organisations that require in, to integrate, which is different from partnership. Uh, and the focus of the attention uh, at this moment in time, I would guess, certainly in Glasgow, but uh, potentially elsewhere as well, is that the majority of the, the, the uh, effort is, is going into ensuring that uh, the two bodies are able to integrate and be uh, fit for purpose from the 1st of April. Now, in the development of the integration scheme, uh, we have to take account of the need for partnerships because one of the things we've consistently said uh, jointly with health is that we are not the only players who will deliver services going forward, but there has to be a proportionality around about the difference between integration of two uh, bodies and the development of partnerships that will actually deliver the services going forward. Very quickly, Bob Doris. Thank you very much, Convener. I, I just thought sitting here we, we should kind of put on the record that the Public Bodies Bill, which will be core to this, it's not just about health and social care integration, potentially across the country, it could be housing and, and, and other services as well. I think, I think that's important. But the point I, I, I wanted to make very briefly was um, in terms of the strategic plan and they get into a local planning level, it's actually a, an audit point for future. I, I was quite taken by Annie Gunnar Logan talking about very local priorities and local co-production, working with older people to see the kind of services that, that they want. That, of course, all has to be audited and accounted for at a later date. I'm just wondering if we come back in one year, two years, three years' time, 
are? Will, will strategic boards be speaking to each other about how they account for all these things? So when this committee comes back in one year or two years' time, we go, right, let's look at local planning and you all account for it in different ways. Will there be a consistency there? Just to say, I mean, I think locality planning and the level of dev devolved decision-making, including financial <laughs> decision-making at locality level, I think is one of the key elements of the, the public bodies bill that, 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 that we have to, have to work out. When I was having a discussion about this in Fife, you know, the needs of Kirkcaldy are not the same as the needs of St Andrews. Uh, you, there are certain things that you're going to have to shape at locality level. So we've got this complex task where we're trying to get, the, 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 as you say, the integration of the, uh, the level of integration required between health and councils. We're saying we need to be full partners as sectors, as third and independent sector provider sectors, and service users have to be full partners. But we have to not spend all the time thinking, what does that look like? You know, at board level or at the, uh, uh, you know, in the corridors of power, what does it actually feel like on the ground in communities, and how do we get some of the the decision making down to, to uh, you know, to that level? So I think this year, this transition year, has to be one of the key areas that has to be focused on. Is we're not just talking about locality planning as a nice idea, but actually, what does it look like? And yes, at the end of the day, that what, if, there, if there is to be devolved decision-making and devolved accountability for monies, that will have to feed back into an audit, an audit trail in a different way. Okay. Annie and then Bill. A really, really quick point, because I think Bob Doris has, has, uh, has described something which is actually quite challenging. Um, the, the partnerships are going to be held to account for outcomes. Uh, but an audit committee is very interested in cost and volume, <laughs> um, that, because that is its nature. So I think one of the one of the challenges we're all going to have is how we can appropriately report on outcomes in a way which also satisfies the requirement of audit. And I, I don't know what the answer to that is, but I just kind of highlight that as something that we, we're going to have to face up to. Okay, Bill. Thank you, Convener. You know, I, th I think we have to acknowledge, if, you, if I go back to the point that was made about Commitment 7 in Exhibit 11, uh, again, it, it talks about a lack of national data. I, I've been talking to the Information Service Division for some time about what are the actual measures that we need going forward. And, and going back to the points that have been made about you know, public sector uh, integration and then the you know, this wider partnership that we need to actually make it happen locally. We, we need to capture information about activity on a wider base. I think that's a key message coming through here. And, and when, I, when I made reference to the integrated resource framework, that's one of the things that we need to look at as well, because the strength of the third sector and independent sector in an area can be a major uh, factor in, in whether communities are, have, have, you know, support resources, resilience around about around about them makes a difference how they consume higher level resources and, and the more that we can actually push towards um, reducing dependency the, the, the figure that's quoted is nine, you know 98 percent of the population at any one time should be outside a formal care setting and, and we should be pushing that that type of measure but we, we need to quantify things that are not going to pop up in a an isd report somewhere as national data and, and maybe Committees like this need to, to, to find the mechanisms by which some of this richer, richer vein of data that's available out there in, in, in local areas can be pulled up and, 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 and viewed, because that, that, that will be very important in seeing how this whole thing all hangs together. Can, can I just follow that through, though, Mr Nicholl? You know, you talked about the need to capture information. Um, are there consistent systems available across the country that would tell us where the gaps in services are, whether the needs have been met, whether services have been delivered effectively and efficiently. Are we able to, to quantify what's happening? Well, I, I don't want to go back to the elephant's graveyard of, um, you know, of integrated health and social care systems, but, but we absolutely need to still resolve that issue. Mm. But, but in terms of that information, that data, being out there, it is out there, it's available. Um, I think in terms of some of the earlier questions about 
you know, whether data was available in local areas or not. I, I'm absolutely clear, looking at the briefing information I have, that across Tayside we have this information. Uh, it's how does that actually find its way up, up to a level where it can, it can be seen at a national level. Um, but we also do need to have systems in place that, um, you know, regardless of which parts of a service or system uh, people are interacting with, we can capture the data and the outcome-focused approach um, and that, that, that has been an elephant's graveyard. I speak as someone who, going back to days when we had a health and social care partnership in Perth and Kinross, had an e-care system that, that used single shared assessment and a single outcomes framework and a single platform of data was a very powerful tool. And we do, need to, we do need to resolve some of those issues. But the starting point would be to find a better way of gathering th th that rich vein of data at a, at a national level from the local areas. And, and, yeah, there's still room for consistent measure, measures across the piece, but some of that needs to be tailored to the, the local okay. issues and the local needs, as I mentioned it, before. It, it's been a long session, and I'm aware that uh, people do have other things to go to. But c c can I finally ask, coming back to this um, question about um, self-funding and personalisation of, of care um, and the potential transfer of resources to the individual to then purchase the care for themselves. How is that being quantified? Is it the case, for example, that if someone in Edinburgh decides to adopt that, that they will prov be provided with the same level of funding to purchase care as in Glasgow, as in Perth, as in Aberdeen? How is it being done? And how will we know whether or not the money being provided is sufficient for that individual to actually purchase the level of care which they require? Mr Walker? I think the, the, the crucial point to SDS is the conversation with the person that needs the care support. So it's about the conversation in terms of support planning, identifying you know, what their aspirations are, what their needs are to live independently, um, what, as what assets that people have in terms of extended family and friends and the community supports that we are uh, trying to create through um, our integrated health and social care working. Um, and it's not about putting a cost right up front and designating a cost. Um, I think it's about that conversation and at appropriate time in that conversation when we find out you know, how we can actually best support that person's needs. We can, we can then bring in a sort of indicative amount into the conversation. Um, we've recently been um, audited um, by Audit Scotland in our approach to SDS, and we were a bit worried about being an outlier and that we haven't raced towards you know, having a, a quick cal calculation of you know, what somebody's need might be in terms of a monetary value. Um, and the feedback we've got verbally, at least, and we we'll await the, the written um, response in June, is that the approach that we're taking has been quite favourable. For example, uh, you know, there are many local authority areas where, um, unless you knew the area, you wouldn't know whether you were standing in one authority or another. I'll, I'll take Glasgow and Renfrewshire as, as an example, but it could also apply to East Renfrewshire, it could apply to West Dumbartonshire, it could apply to East Dumbartonshire. Um, and maybe to the east and south Lanarkshire. I, I, if someone um, approaching Paisley, uh, or someone lives in, in the approaches to Paisley, um, coming along um, the Paisley Road West um, towards the boundary, and they're assessed by Glasgow City Council as requiring X amount of money to provide their social care, if they then decide to move just a few hundred yards across the boundary, into Renfrewshire. Now, the network of family and support would still be there, but would they then be able to access the same monetary support from Renfrewshire Council as they do from Glasgow City Council? Uh, convener, probably not. Uh, I and think there is, uh, again, it comes, it, it, it relates to uh, the level of resource that's available to local authority social work departments and how that is managed and distributed, as Katrina highlighted but, but earlier. Can on. I stop you there? Yeah. It, you know, you're saying it depends on the level of resources available to the local authority and to the social work department. Yes. But I thought that we were assessing the requirements and the needs of the individual, that they will have a care plan. Yeah. Now, 
If they require a certain value of money to deliver that care under self-financing, self self-funding care, and they move a few hundred yards, why would the level of care for them change, leaving the local authorities aside? Well, it's about, it's about the assessed need, and you're right to co uh, concentrate and focus on the level of uh, assessed need and the nature of the services that are provided within that. Uh, and the individual budgets that are available uh, is a matter of determination and, and a matter of responsibility for each of the 32 local authorities. Uh, uh, should it be that way? I don't know. Uh, but that's the way it is at this moment in time, uh, because uh, the expectation is that local authorities will manage the budgets that they have available to them. And my responsibility uh, is to ensure that there is a fairness uh, and an equity of access to the level of resource for all citizens who have uh, broadly similar needs within uh, Glasgow City Council's boundary. Uh, the priority that we place on uh, that might be different from Renfrewshire or East Renfrewshire or uh, all of the remaining uh, well, authorities. Well, assuming that's the case, and say it was the other way, say it was someone who had been assessed in Ralston. Um, by Renfrewshire Council is requiring uh, a certain sum of money uh, each day to yep. deliver care, and they then contract with the local independent or, or, or private sector to, to purchase that care. They move a couple of hundred yards into Glasgow. Is there then another community care plan produced? Uh, well, uh, there are the, it's not a straightforward matter around about the transfer of responsibilities between local authorities relating to adults, and there are, are issues around about uh, what's called uh, issues of ordinary residents, about people who have uh, responsibilities, and that is that the, uh, in, in many cases the responsibility re remains with the original local authority if the individual uh, moves. Now, if there's a choice issue and people are out, have capacity to move uh, and uh, want to have services in a different area, uh, then uh, there's uh, very li and, and make a, an approach to the local authority that they've moved into for an assessment of their need. Uh, then that local authority will uh, 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 undertake an assessment of that need and a, a, an outcome-based support plan. Now, the, the benefit and the interesting thing around about uh, self-directed support uh, is that it affords the individual the opportunity to continue to use, uh, if they so choose, the provider that they had previously. Yes, exactly. The level of resource that. might be different. Well, ex uh -huh. yeah, exactly. That's the point. Yeah. So if they move from one authority to another, they might choose to access the same provider of support, but they might be given either more or less to do so by... Well, they may well do, authority. but the level, of, uh, the level of community assets uh, and support arrangements will be different in Glasgow to what they are available to people in East Renfrewshire or Renfrewshire, for instance. So uh, people may be able to access a different type of service. No, no, but I'm support. talking about someone who lives in a community where services are interchangeable. I'm not, I'm not talking about two people living, you know, one in Castle Milk and, and one in Johnson. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about people who will be living in a community where the care providers will be local care providers mm -hmm. um, who will probably provide services across uh, boundary areas. And, and, and all I'm wondering is, firstly, will there be a, a second uh, assessment done? And, and, and secondly, if there is, if the same assessment is made for the level of care, why is it that you could potentially have one level of payment in one authority and a second level of payment in another? It, you know, it's, it's almost as if we're well, in terms a, of a postcode lottery. Well, in terms of uh, the uh, uh, provision of uh, services to uh, individuals right across the country, that's always been the case. Mm. Uh, and uh, and self-directed support legislation hasn't changed that. Uh, it just is now the case that uh, individuals have a clear indication of the level of financial resource available to them uh, with which to uh, have their needs met. Annie? Sorry, I'm busting to get in here because it's my favourite subject. A um, number of points. The first one is that there's, there's got, um, a monitoring and evaluation plan for self-directed support, which should at some point be able to tell the committee how many people are choosing the different options under, under SDS, of which there are four, um, I, I would remind the committee. Um, the second point is that... that the principle of the self-directed support legislation is that individuals should be able to exercise as much choice and control as they want 
regardless of whether they take the money and buy their own services. You know, even if they say, I don't want to choose, you know, just give me a service, they should still have the right to exercise choice and control over the service that they receive, and I think that's often misunderstood. Um, the third point is the differences aren't just across boundaries. They're actually within the same council area, because, for example, yeah. if you choose option two under SDS, where you say, well, I don't want to take the money as a direct payment, but I'd like you, council, to, to spend my money on provider X. Um, if provider X charges, I don't know, for argument's sake, £14 an hour. Now, if you want option one, which is a direct payment, you will not get £14 an hour. You will get £11.50 or whatever it is, because councils have set completely different rates for direct payments under option one then they might be prepared to pay under option two. So in other words, if you want to exercise kind of maximum choice and control and actually take the money and buy your own care, you'll get, you're not going to be able to buy as much of it as you would under options two and three. And, I, uh, and um, oh, well. the reason why I get excited about this is because my organisation attempted to amend the legislation to stop that happening, and I have to say that we didn't actually succeed in that, but I think that one's going to come back to haunt us. Fourth point, if you would, is that um, I read a number of the joint strategic commissioning plans for reshaping care for older people around this time last year, and I was astonished at how few of them even mentioned self-directed support as a way in which older people could be drawn into the process of reshaping their own care. Um, it, it was almost invisible in a number of the plans I read. And the final point is that Audit Scotland is now involved in a performance audit of preparations for self-directed support. So when that's done, um, this is where it will come. Um, so I would look forward to a, a, a much uh, more comprehensive discussion of that issue because I think it's very, very important. Okay. Uh, I think I'll give you the final word. Thank you very much for that, Annie. Um, Right, it's been a long session, it's a very productive session. Actually, you know, it's a kind of discussion that could go on much longer. Um, there are huge and fundamental issues, not all of which are necessarily uh, audit responsibilities, many of them are, are care responsibilities, but it's clearly going to be a challenge for everyone, uh, irrespective of their responsibility. So thank you very much for your contributions this morning. Thank you. And we will suspend the meeting for a short time.
Can I uh, reconvene item three on the agenda, uh, major capital projects. Um, committee members um, have before them um, an update on the major capital projects from the Scottish Government. Um, you'll note that the report is in the, or the update is in the new format. It's actually very detailed and quite interesting, um, listing the number of projects and uh, some information uh, about them. Now, it's not our job to monitor or evaluate the progress in each individual project. It's more about one of process, um, um, you know, whether or not there are uh, any issues arising uh, from that. Um, any comments from committee members? Yeah. Mary? Yeah, could be a very much welcome the new format. Um, given it a drive up and down the A9 most weeks, apart from winter, getting the train, uh, the A9 has disappeared. There's no A9. Sorry? <laughs> I came down by. It's disappeared from the major uh, cab. It's been in everyone since I came on the committee. But I just wonder if we can get an update, because I am aware that quite a lot uh, is uh, in progress on the A9, and there's considerable plans to completely dual uh, the A9, and uh, I would welcome an update. This is the only one that's been missing. Right. OK, well, we can write and ask that. Thank Ken you. McIntosh? Uh, I am not sure I do welcome this, because I have to say... Uh, I'm not quite sure what the point of this is, but it doesn't seem to monitor change. Now, the, the first part of the section, which is the new additional information, which is the list of all these projects uh, greater than 20 million, um, uh, well, it's useful. It's just a, it's just a list. Um, what it doesn't, uh, what it doesn't tell you, and in fact, what it doesn't tell you, more importantly, on the major projects, the ones that we used to get uh, uh, information on, is how they've changed from the last time they were reported on. Now, I thought the whole point was that we had a baseline position and then we measured uh, what is happening now against the baseline position. The, 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 there seems to be no I went through the whole thing. Uh, the only comment that I could find was uh, that, that actually suggested any kind of change was on page 22... Under Kilmarnock Campus, Ayrshire College, there has been slight slippage in reaching financial close. And then on the page below, page 23, under the V&A and D, uh, the project has been subject to some slippage due to movement of the proposed site. It, that's the only mention of any change at all in the whole document, which I, I, so I don't understand. I, the old document, from memory, and the major projects told you what the initial cause was at the start, what the dates were, and then told you about any in-work in uh, uh, changes uh, to that. So this seems to be a, a, an entirely backward step. Uh, it's got this useful information, supposedly the contribution made towards local economic development, but the variation in information here is incredible. Some of them are quite detailed and quite helpful, list number of jobs and apprenticeships and uh, involvement in procurement con conditions and so on, which are very useful. Some of them give nothing of the sort. And it doesn't even be, be, be so dependent on the size of the project. There was, a, remember, there was one of the major projects, let's see if I can find it again, which was, uh, it, it gave no detail whatsoever. Uh, let me just see if I can find which one it was. I can't find it now, but it was one of the one of the major projects. You have no no detail whatsoever of what the impact would be. Well, here we are. The Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Programme on page 15. You know, I mean, this is a, a £742 million project and it will deliver enhanced connectivity. I mean, it's got nothing whatsoever about jobs, apprenticeships, or anything else. So, so, I mean, this is, you know, these things are, are useful. Now, maybe we have to evolve from this, but at the moment... Um, I'd like to know what the minimum amount of information that is we're expecting. Uh, maybe we can that could be supplemented by additional information, um, but uh, not to have any information particularly on one a project of that size struck me as odd. I'll just give you a, a, an example of the, the of, of why it, it's difficult to believe what's happening in, in this document. The very last page, page 24, and it says project the Scottish Crime, Cam Crime Campus. 
So the full business case for the project outlined it would cost £82 million. Pounds. Uh, the practical completion achieved in autumn 2013 prior to the agencies becoming operational in the new building. And it says practical completion of the project was completed on time and on budget in autumn 2013. Now, that didn't quite ring a bell with me, so I just looped up just while I was here. And uh, just give you, tell you something. This is from the Scottish Government website, Scottish Crime Campus. Um, a, a press release from the government on the 14th of April 2009. Um, <clears throat> Kenny McCaskill says, uh, uh, the work is underway. I expect the campus to be operational by late 2011. Late 2011. And then there's another one just above that, March 2010. He says, full steam ahead for the crime campus. And he says, uh, uh, subject to contract, we expect the first agency to move into the campus in 2012 with full occupancy by mid-2013. Now, it just opened in February 2014, so... I just don't understand what this means, because that's not... And, and also, the early one said it was costing £65 million. so I'm just not... I don't understand what this document does for us. Right, well, there are a number of issues raised there. You know, for example, on, on the issues of variations, it could well be that there are only two projects where there are va va variations. But I think, <coughs> you know, the, 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 the issues you have listed are, are, are legitimate questions to ask, and we can write to the Scottish Government to ask for clarification both on <coughs> the specific items that you've mentioned but also on the process issues um, about how um, information will be will be provided because you know I, I would hope as you say that there is an evolutionary process that um, we are trying to improve as we go Bob Doris and then Willie Coffey I'll try and be brief convener I, I, I think you fit the tone perfectly right with this convener because the reason this looks like this is because of an ongoing dialogue between this committee and the Scottish Government. Um, we've, we've fed in a couple of times how we'd like the figures to be to be presented, and I think you're right, that's evolutionary. We can con continue to do that. What I would be interested to know, well, just in terms of whether things are on budget, I noticed on page 13 the MA, M73 and M74 network improvements does actually talk about one that I think is perhaps under budget and there was another one I spotted as well um, if I can uh, find it here I'll, I'll not tie up the, the committee's time I can't find the one that I had had identified but what I'd be keen to know is quite similar to Ken McIntosh actually is but what do we mean by by on budget because obviously significant things can change during the lifetime of, of, a, of a project so if the budget is revised in 2012 or 2013, we have, uh, is it on budget compared to the new baseline budget? So in other words, if, if something significantly revised, say January 2013, and it's completed January 2014, and in that one year period, it's bang on budget for the new budget from January 2013, if com committee members are still following me, but there was a realignment in, uh, on, on, on the, the budget because of uh, events earlier, should that always be flagged up in the latest report that we have. I think all the information is there, convener. It's merely how it's presented in this document, and I'm just nervous it could get a bit unwieldy. So it's just about how we present it in a, a sensible and focused manner. And right, as I suggested to, to the Scottish uh, Government, what I think w w we can also do is list at some point um, on our agenda a discussion with Audit Scotland um, just to get some further analysis of um, how this has been used. Ken McIntosh and then Willie Coffey. Uh, indeed. Just two things that Bob said there, let me pick up on. Uh, the one on page 13 about the N873 and M74, uh, I, I didn't quite follow this because it, it suggests that the NPD contract has reduced in value from 415 to 310, but then says the total cost of the project is estimated to be 435 million. So even that by itself was not very clear to me about what the saving was, whether or not the total cost was saved. So, these, and this, this is one of the ones that's one of the major projects. Um, the Egypt project, I mean, I, I don't want to list them all. I, I, and I hope you don't just uh, ask the government for con comments on the ones that I'm picking out, because Egypt, on page 15, the full business case has recently been published, outlines that the cost of the first phase of the programme is 742 million. The project is progressing on time and on budget. I mean. That doesn't even come close to summarising what's happened to Egypt. I mean, not, that doesn't even come close. That project's gone through so many different changes. 
And it was this, as I remember, I, th I think it was this, it was a report from the previous document that was presented to this committee that flagged up to Parliament in the first place that the project had slipped by, you know, reduced by 350 million and had been stripped out and it was no longer recognisable in its original sense. So, you know, that was a very important contribution that this Parliament's scrutiny of major projects made to the spending of public money. It allowed us to ask questions and, you know, turn the gaze of parliamentary scrutiny on a huge sum of money. Yeah, if I may just go back to Annie Gunner-Logan earlier, when she said, you know, we spend, ask people to jump, jump through hoops to justify spending £20,000, and yet we're talking here about £742 million in, in two sentences. In fact, yeah, two sentences. And, and I, I, I simply do not think that by listing, and that's all it is, is just a list of projects with no useful information that we can scrutinise in any way other than knowing that they're happening. I don't think that's any help whatsoever. I think that all that will happen there is that those that list of information will get in the way of us actually analysing what really matters, which is, are, you know, are, are uh, projects um, being delivered uh, in the way that they said they would be delivered, uh, on, the, on schedule, to the same amount of money, you know, by the same vehicle, you know, have they been realigned? You know, all the questions that we should be asking uh, of a proper audit process. Okay, thanks, Willie Coffey. Right, convener, my recollection of this uh, at various times in the past at the committee is that it, it kind of matches what we broadly asked for then. Right? It really does. It matches up what we were asking for. We're, we're not a committee that's micromanaging or project managing these, these capital projects. We're not doing that. If, if we think we now need more and more detailed information, that's another matter. But I think it does broadly, broadly reflect what we asked for in the past. What I think is missing, though, and I wanted to suggest, uh, we don't seem to have an indication of the contingency set aside or spend. I think we had asked for some inclusion of that at some point in the past, because it did come up uh, in several committees previously. I think we were interested in the contingency set aside and spend as part of this, but I mean, if members want more detail about the particular um, status of a particular piece of work, I mean, I'd, be, I'd be quite happy to, to see that too, but it, it'll just mean that there'll be, there'll be more and more detail for us in these, and that wasn't the purpose of it. Um, on, the, on the contingency issue, if you look at the reply from Sir Peter Housden, there's a section there on contingency. Um, uh, I, you know, suggested that we, we do right to the Scottish Government. We'll try to seek some more clarification on all the, the broad issues as well as the specific issues that are identified. Uh, and we'll also schedule a, a discussion with Audit Scotland about the way that the reports uh, or the way that these have been used. Bob Doris. Uh, I, I will try to keep it brief. Uh, I think Ken McIntosh makes a reasonable point in relation to the, the M8, M73 and M74 improvements. I remember during a previous discussion on this, one of the things I raised, and I don't think it's reflected in this, was that the, the, there is development costs for the project and there can be other costs such as land purchase costs and the like, and I'd asked where that would be accounted. And I'm not saying that is the reason for the gap in this situation, but that's maybe something that we had previously asked for that hasn't been presented. But by and large, what I've seen for it was pretty much what we've been asking for. What we're maybe getting as a committee is a little bit more sophisticated and what it is we want. And the second thing I would just put on the record is just, just getting us to confirm, well, bear with me, Mr McIntosh, to confirm whether or not this is all the information that's been provided on this, because this could be a, a summary update of information and other information might already be in the public domain for us to access. So it's whether if we choose to dig beneath that, how quickly and easily we find it. So do we want it in the summary or do we want to be able to dig beneath it in a focused manner? Because if you get back into that argument again, convener, well, they give us too much information, we say, how do we pick out the needle in the haystack? They give us focused information, we say we're not getting enough information. So it's getting the balance right and doing it in a collegiate way with the government. OK. Um, suggested uh, course of action, is that agreed? Okay, thank you very much for that. We'll now move into private session.